Um, so with that, I am going to call to order the January 26, 2021 meeting. If everybody could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and then for a moment of silence. Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Republic. 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 Which it stands. One nation. One nation. Under God. Under God. Indivisible. Indivisible. With liberty and, and justice. justice for all. Okay, thank you. Make my screen small again. <clears throat> All right, uh, gets us to number four, proclamations and presentations. Um, tonight we have two proclamation requests, 4.1 proclamation requests condemning the January 6th attack on our national capital, 4.2 proclamation requests regarding racism as a public health emergency. Um, actually, I had a request, um, Steve, I didn't know if you still wanted to, um, request to move public participation, partition, holy moly, cannot speak, public participation up or not. Um, if everyone's in favor of that, I think that might be best. It seems like we have a lot of people on that may be looking to speak on those two matters. Okay, I'll second that. So actually, if you want to make a motion. Um, yeah, sorry, Steve Jones, I'll entertain a motion to move item five, public petitions, communications and public participation uh, prior to item number four, proclamations and presentations. You'll we'll make move a second. entertain the motion, I'm sorry. Um, what was that, Brenda? Steve's wording was that he would entertain a motion. Okay, that so. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, so I think Brenda first did and Lou seconded for that, <laughs> just for procedure reasons. Okay. Okay, uh, any discussion? Um, all those in favor, uh, Brenda? Aye. Cassandra? I think her mic is not working, so she just did a thumbs up. <laughs> I, sorry, I'm trying to find my button. That's okay. Um, Steve? Aye. Uh, John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. All right, I'm an aye, so that passes unanimously. So at that point, we are moving public participations and communications to uh, now. Uh, any subject within the jurisdiction of the town council with a two minute limit. Um, Steve, if you want to do the timer on that, that anybody who is on a device, you can raise your hand. Um, we will call on you on order of people raising their hand. Please state your name and address for the record before your two minutes. If you are on a phone and would like to say something, it is star nine. That will also raise your hand and we will call on you um, in order. If you're utilizing the app, you might have to click on reactions or I believe participants to find the raise hand button. That's true, yes. Um, so if you go to reactions, you'll see the raise hand. Um, Monique. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, I'm here. Uh, dear members, can I start? Uh, yep. yep, you have a two minute limit, yep. Okay, dear members of Tallinn Town Council, um, after reading the article, Tallinn Council asked to declare racism a public health crisis, I needed to speak up against this request. The president's advisory recently spoke about this, where he stated natural equity requires not only the consent of the governed, but also the recognition of fundamental human rights, with a fundamental duty and obligation of all to respect the rights of others. These rights are found in nature and are not created by man or government. Rather, they are created, they create governments to secure natural rights. A bad government may deny or ignore natural rights and even prevent their existence in the real world but it can never be eliminate them. Simply put, equality among humans is a fundamental human right that not all humans respect. They can't create it and still it. Our free will and individual self-character will deem how we treat others, not people's emergency edicts. It is wasteful and counterproductive for officials of Tallinn to declare racism, public health crisis, and enact an emergency declaration when humans determine how we treat each other, not emergency declarations. Fear incited into citizens by spotlighting and igniting racism, ultimately being used as a political agenda. 
when racism in Tallinn does not exist is shameful. Oh. Our Tallinn electors shouldn't even consider this. It's disrespectful to the citizens who live in Tallinn for whom the council was appointed to serve and support. Based on my 50 years of living here in the Tallinn community, I test, can testify to its rich existence of inclusivity, equality, and harmony. It's not a public health crisis. If Tallinn Council wishes to be a leader in the community, they should not jump on this politically motivated bandwagon. It serves nothing. It separates our blended community, exacerbates this long road of healing. Instead, the Council should enact events for inclusivity. They include freedom and truth and commonality. It should gear its local efforts towards incurring, encouraging Americanism and hospitality. As elected leaders of our community, is your obligation to, leave your, to, lead, to lead your constituents' ethnic race out of the equation of governing and focus your efforts on creating programs and policies to benefit and protect all humans and support them all with equal unbiasedness. I respectfully oppose this declaration of racism as a public health crisis in Tallinn. Monique Grace Gaudet Burns, 82 Plains Road, Tallinn, Connecticut. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Just uh, just to check to see is uh, just uh, I know that there's two 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 minute time limit. I just want to uh, I don't know if Steve is taking care of that. Or it, it, yeah, it did it did go just over two two minutes. It seemed like they were summarizing, so I didn't want to interject. Okay. It was probably like one, one sentence sure or so left. So, Thank but you. yeah, I do have it set in my system. Okay, um, Luke. Luke Anderson, 44 Zinfandel Circle. I'm in favor of the proclamation declaring racism a public health crisis. According to the Boston University School of Public Health, a public health crisis if must affect large numbers of people, must threaten health over the long term, and must require the adoption of large scale solutions. Racism, when looked at and addressed systemically, is indeed a public health crisis, which through institutional and interpersonal behavior impacts people's health. Um, and it's important to address the root of the problem and be concerned with racism itself rather than concerns of being called racist. Um, let's take the obvious example of the pandemic. If you look at the data from Governor Lamont's January 19th press briefing, non-Hispanic whites risk of death from COVID um, rises sharply in their 50s and 60s, whereas for Black and Hispanic Connecticut residents, the risk of death starts being much higher in their 30s and 40s. Overall, BIPOC people's risk of death under, from COVID is two to three times higher than non-Hispanic whites. And this is due to a wide range of social factors like poor healthcare access and higher rates of exposure as essential workers. Some say that beyond COVID, there is no significant health issues disproportionately impacting BIPOC communities, especially within Tallinn. However, there is only one federally qualified healthcare center in Tallinn County, and these are required to provide care regardless of insurance status or ability to pay and, proportion and are proportionately far more BIPOC people are uninsured. This also raises the question of transportation, the number one issue for BIPOC people, according to Mary Weiner, manager of the State Office of Rural Health, in a town where only the only public transportation is a bus stop that you need to drive to, and that matters. People may further argue that public health issues should be focusing on things more close to home, like potable water, drug abuse, and suicide. This gets into the additional issue of environmental racism, looking at where water and air quality is worse, um, where there are incinerators and dumps in mostly BIPOC communities such as East Hartford. Opening up the town and its beautiful nature and supporting BIPOC communities is anti-racist. Um, and additionally, alcoholism, suicide rates are historically highest amongst indigenous communities in America due to institutional and cultural displacement and oppression. So the very least we can do is acknowledge that this is unceded to Muck and Mohegan land. Um, and with all of this, it is not a question of either or, it is a matter of both and. And by focusing on policy, um, our policy on the needs of the most vulnerable, everyone benefits. Food is also crucial, speaking from my um, experience. Sorry, Mr. Anderson, I just have to interrupt. I kind of let you go 30 seconds beyond the two minute limit if you're able to, to summarize. Yeah, um, so BIPOC children are most likely to be affected by school food. So universal um, reduced and free prices is also anti-racist policies that are supported by this plan. Um, and some people fear a true intent behind it. And I just want people to um, look at and evaluate why they feel that way with a statement that's looking to address and repair harms from the past. Thank you. 
Um, anybody else? Just in case anyone joined late, we did move our public participation before the proclamation. So uh, if you're looking to speak now is the time, there will be another point to do so at the end of the meeting. Um, Hi, actually, my name is, oh, oh go, go ahead. ahead. Whoever was go going ahead, to go first. Cindy, that's you? You go yep. and then I'll go. Okay, go Okay, um, I'm Cindy Fontanella, 14 Anthony Road. I've been a resident here for 37 years. I've been a teacher in this town and um, raised three kids. And I just don't feel that we need to do this at this time. I'm against this proclamation. Um, it's what it's going to do is go it's going to force us to allocate resources to this thing that and I've never experienced racism in our town. There might be I mean, obviously, there's racism in our country. I'm not saying that. But in our town, we don't need to go along with this. We we this is something that racism in the hearts and the minds of people. It's not something that the government should go into and allocate resources for in our town. I'm not saying that some towns don't need to do that, but our town, Tallinn, as far as my experience, being a teacher in the town, having raised kids in the town, I just don't feel that we need to do this at this time. Um, we have other issues that need our resources, our talents, and I don't think that this is something that we need to worry about right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Julie, I think you were next. Hi, I was just wondering, did you get my email? Were you able to look at it or should I read it? Um, we probably definitely got it. Uh, whether or not everybody has had time to read it or respond <laughs> yet, um, I can't account for. If you haven't heard back from people then, if, if, as long as you can do it in the two minutes, you are- okay, you stop me if I'm not done. I will read as quickly as I can, okay? Um, it says the issue of racism in Thailand and or Connecticut. So I was made aware that there's going to be a meeting on whether or not Governor Lamont should call a state of emergency for racism in Connecticut. And also that my town council here in Tolland is speaking about it this evening. I have lived in Tolland with my husband for 23 years and raised four children here, two girls, two boys. Um, their ages are 37, 34, 27, and 22. I would like to brag that I live in the best town in Connecticut. However, I do know that a lot of people feel that way about their town. So Connecticut is filled with lots of wonderful towns that make our state special. But I especially feel that way about the town of Tolland. There is so much going on in the world today, but I feel that racism is not one that's in our town and even in our state of Connecticut. Do I think it's a state of emergency situation? Absolutely not at all. As a matter of fact, I was straight, I was caught off guard when somebody said, they were trying to push through that. And I was like, what? No, not here. Rather saddened that anyone would think that there was a state of emergency racism kind of situation. Is there differences? Yes. Have we exhausted every opportunity to bring unity? I think not. And it's, exact, and it's not exactly all of our fault. We've had to stay, in, um, stay away from each other due to COVID-19 which I can say our state is doing extremely well dealing with that. And I thank everybody for doing their part. I go to church here and I have attended the same church for 22 years and I have a small little business cutting hair. My husband has his business in the Tallinn industrial park as a sprinkler contractor in fire protection for fire protection. My youngest daughter is married and is going to raise her children in this town because it is such a, uh, it has such good memories of greatness, kindness, and the overall feeling that even a stranger would, you get, would give you the shirt off their back should you need it. That has been my family's experience living here in Tallinn, I'm proud to say. No matter whether you're a Democrat or Republican, we have managed to stay united and always gathered for the common good of our neighbors, no matter what the situation is. Whether it be special needs playground that needed to go up, helping with the friends at Tallinn Library, etc., or planting flowers, around certain areas to make our beloved Tallinn Green look even more beautiful than it does with its rich history. We have a great, awesome town. We're very I'm lucky to and project, fortunate. Um, if you could summarize, my apologies. Okay. So, so no, so um, I feel that like, um, I was thinking that if anything, we could maybe bring up something to do with causing unity once we can all you know, gather, maybe something in town 
so because there's so many wonderful people here and we've all been kind of like sheltered in with all this happening around us. I don't think we've really gotten to know each other um, and maybe we could do some special things. That's all to cause, um, you know, togetherness in the town before doing something like this. Thank you. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, anybody else? I see uh, Kristen Morgan has their hand raised. Oh, okay. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm Kristen Morgan. I live at 167 Dockerill Road in Tolland. And I would like to um, read a brief statement. Um, I'm asking you today to join other town councils across Connecticut in declaring racism as a public health crisis. This initiative has been gaining support in all 50 states since 2019 and is supported by the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Physicians, and the American Public Health Association, among other professional health organizations. American Medical Association board member, Dr. Willard V. Edwards notes, declaring racism as an urgent public health threat is a step in the right direction towards advancing equality in medicine and public health while creating pathways for truth, healing, and reconciliation. Some may feel that proactively addressing issues of racial justice in Tolland is unnecessary due to its majority white population. However, this declaration is an opportunity for the town to affirm the inherent dignity and worth of our growing numbers of BIPOC community members. It's also an opportunity to stand in solidarity with other Connecticut towns that have recognized the discrepancy in quality health care that one might receive based on their race. Others might believe that making this declaration does not address the fact that poor white people also face health care discrimination. However, history has shown us time and time again that by lifting up our most vulnerable populations, all people are lifted as well. In the curricula used to teach civil rights and Holocaust history to K-12 students, the role of the upstander is examined by students. An upstander is an individual who speaks or acts in support of an individual or cause, particularly someone who intervenes on behalf of a person being attacked or bullied. During the Holocaust, the fight for civil rights, and in other struggles around the world, there have been bystanders who have enjoyed the privilege of turning a blind eye to the struggles of their fellow human beings. I'm sure we have all wondered how much we would have personally risked to fight Nazis or to end lynchings of innocent Black people. The current reckoning with racial justice, which has come into clear focus over the last year, gives us an opportunity to be bystanders and upstanders. The reckoning is happening whether we are ready or not. I urge the members of the town council to choose to be upstanders rather than bystanders and to pledge our town's solidarity with the other towns across Connecticut that have shown a light on this vital issue. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Kathy? Oh, you're still muted, Kathy, if you're able to unmute yourself. Unmute. Okay, there you are. Oh. There you go. Right. Um, Kathy Sanner, I live at 37 Greyhaven Road in Tolland. I have been a resident of Tolland for 50 years and raised my family here. Um, there's no need for me to be redundant, um, but I agree. I, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for 50 years as well. Um, I see. Um, I see the need. I'm working right now with the Department of Public Health doing COVID vaccinations. Um, but I agree wholeheartedly with what Kristen said, and I don't want to be redundant. I would say exactly the same thing that Kristen Morgan said. I agree that we need to be upstanders. Uh, whether you feel that we have racism here in Tolland, um, I think it exists everywhere uh, to a certain degree. And I do think that we just need to be aware and we need to, to join with the other communities and the, um, in the state of Connecticut and say that that's not okay. So that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I'm Deborah Warner. I'm not sure how to raise my hand and I'm not sure if I'm allowed to speak yet. Um, you can go ahead. Okay. I've lived in Tallinn for uh, 25 years or so. I live at Three Harvest Lane and I have to agree with Luke and Kristen and I'm sorry I didn't get the name of the woman who just spoke, Kathy, that yes, um, we should proclaim that racism is systemic in the US in general. And if Tolland can go ahead and say, yes, we agree, we need to do something about it, given the opportunity, I'm all for it. I really think we can. And I don't want to be redundant and repeat what everybody else said. But I have to say is I think we should be the people standing up to say something, even though we don't feel it affects us because we live in a town that is affluent and mostly white. So we don't see it so much. But where I came from in New York City, I seen it a lot. And if we can do something to help lift other people up, it lifts us all up. I'm done. Thank you. Um, is it Annalise? Oh, and you're still muted, by the way. There Sorry. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So yeah, I just I just wanted to follow along and and um, say that. I feel like it's very, very important. I, you know, I'm a mother of a biracial child in this town. I've lived here since I was a child myself and growing up in this town um, and going through the school systems, having friends and family, you know, knowing families all around here for, you know, the past, I'm 32 and I've lived here since I was in second grade. So many, many years, um, you know, I, racism has been real. It is here and it, you know, um, I, I've, ex I've, I've heard it from my friends and I've, you know, experienced, um, you know, just, uh, just all of the, <clears throat> the negative, you know, talk around race and, and the, you know, the N word and, and all of that stuff. And, and then when I, you know, came back here with my son and, and I, you know, the first time he be was called the N-word was he was eight years old, you know, and, and so it's, it is not something that has gone away and disappeared in this town. It's still, it's very real. It's here. And we have had many experiences where his race has, you know, resulted in very, you know, negative and, and sad experiences for him. And, and it, it, it hurts him and, you know, to have, you know, he's 10 at this point and to have a 10 year old who asked to, to move, to move, you know, what 10 year old asked to move out of the town, to move to a different town. I want to be around people of my own race who will accept me and I'll feel welcomed. You know, that's, that's a very real statement coming from a, you know, 10 year old child. Most 10 year olds don't want to move out of their town. <laughs> they want to stay with their friends, but um, you know, because my child is of the minority and he does, he experiences racism on, you know, almost a daily basis in this town. Uh, it's, he does not, it's not comfortable. It affects him emotionally and mentally. Um, and these things ultimately result in, you know, yes, you know, physical, um, you know, physically it, it will affect him. So I just, um, I urge people to, to step outside of their own shoes and, and to think what it might feel like to live, you know, to be a person of color in this town. Um, Sorry, know. Annalise, I'm, I apologize. Go job. ahead, yep, no yeah. worries. All right, so that that's it. So please let's declare <laughs> racism as a pu public health crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kenny. Kenny Trice, 53 Doe Run, Tallinn, Connecticut. So what I heard this evening was, let's do nothing from some people. And others said, oh, let's wait a while. First of all, my compliments to the lady that was speaking before, because she is, I can definitely understand what she's feeling. I'm going to ask a rhetorical question. How many of you have been in a tenement fire? Chances are probably none of you. Unfortunately, I've been in two of them in New York City. You never forget black smoke, flames coming at you, struggling for your life while you drag your grandmother to get to the roof. That's a feeling that never leaves you. 
by the same token, those who say there's no racism here, I've never experienced it. I've been here for 50 years. I have a question for you. How would you know? How would you know? If you've never been in a tenement fire like me, you wouldn't know what that feels like. So how would you know? There is one thing I can say. There's an overarching theme in this country. The conversations at the dinner tables for black, brown, and mixed families is vastly different than the conversations of the white majority of Americans who are not impacted by racism. That is a fact. So for you to say, let's do nothing, you're not impacted by it. Let's wait a while, doesn't bother you. That's human nature. Doesn't bother me. Why should I give a hoot? But I will tell you, it's here. My children have experienced it. My wife has experienced it. We even joked one time when a lady came to the door and asked my wife, can I speak to the lady of the house? And Teresa closed the door and said, could you hold on for a minute? She waited count to 10, came back and said, can I help you? My children can tell you some of the experience they have. So please do not tell me or the lady that spoke before that racism is not here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kate Bell. Oh, sorry, I said your last name. Kate, <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry about that. I'm Kate Ballow, 80 Town Green. Um, first, I just want to thank the previous speakers um, for their eloquence and also for sharing your personal experiences. Um, it's really helpful to hear. Uh, I'm a white lady, um, and so it's really helpful for me to hear um, what the experiences are um, of people of color in this town. Um, we pre I appreciate you speaking up. We're approaching about a year. Um, in February, I believe, since I first wrote to the town council um, to discuss uh, some discriminatory remarks that I saw posted on social media by a leader of the town on the town council. Um, I was requesting that there be some sort of social media policy to um, help provide some guideposts for our leaders to help um, really shine a light on how are we comporting ourselves um, so that we are a welcoming community for all people. Um, I haven't seen any action steps taken as of yet. I understand we've been in a pandemic. I would ask right now for there to be some real thoughtful discussion, um, some careful consideration of all the perspectives that you've heard here tonight that perhaps you've heard some letters on. Um, think about you know, what you think. Um, let, it, let this be a serious conversation. Um, and I would like to also speak in strong support of this proclamation. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? Tammy, I oh, had... I'm just going to, I'm sorry, Tammy, pardon me. Um, uh, I don't think my time was up. Let me just say, I also think that you should probably discuss that social media policy still. Thanks. Bye. Um, okay. Um, Tammy, you received two emails asking to be um, read into the record about this. We don't read into the record for emails. We can attach them, but um, it, our, we have never read into the record. We have read into the record because I know I've done it. Mike, can you confirm, please, that we do not read into the record on this? We can attach emails, uh, but we do not read into the record. I think it's council's choice. I think you can, we've done it before where there's, we've added to the minutes. We've, like you said, we've added the actual email to the record. People who have asked to add their language or their email into the record, we've sometimes just put it into the minutes rather than actually read it and all the way through. I think I think it's up to the, your choice, everybody, council. Um, quick yes or no, read into the minutes or just put them as read into the record or put them as minutes. Uh, John? Uh, minutes. Steve? Um, I, I was going to say minutes, but I, I, I think there might be some confusion on the discussion because when we've had communications from residents and they've requested it be read into the record, at that point in the meeting, we've read 
letters in their entirety. It's very seldom, um, but I don't know if it's ever been done for public participation and mm -hmm. communications. I guess that's probably the only confusion I have. So okay. that's a good, I'm actually, under, yeah. Underneath this section, I feel like it falls under um, being- Okay, I, you're right. I should have yeah. waited until we got to 4.2. So I will wait until we get to 4.2. Hey, um, John. Yes. Uh, so we're discussing the permission now. Is that what we're doing? Uh, John Crickmore, you had your hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, I thought I missed the discussion part. Um, I wasn't going to read anything tonight. I sent an email in. Um, I just want to make a couple points. Um, first of all, um, I, I'm the only um, white person that lives in my house. Uh, my family immigrated, or my wife, I should say, immigrated to this country 10 years ago. Um, she became a citizen this year on Election Day, actually, and after the ceremony, she was quite excited to be able to, to vote in her first election as a United States citizen. And uh, my wife doesn't look like most of us in Tallinn. She has a heavy accent, and uh, she went to the town hall to register. She couldn't, you know, she, she was registering day of, and... And she, I remember her coming home so excited that so many people wanted to take a picture with her because no one in Thailand uh, that was working the polls had ever had someone be sworn in as a citizen and come down to vote the same day. Um, we have a child together who, I guess for proper terminology, would be considered a minority, although we don't look at each other as minorities. Um, and, and I hear a lot about what this proclamation will do. And if this proclamation would actually do something, I could maybe be in favor for it. But it really does nothing. Um, I heard of one person speak about the racism that their child has has gone through in the school. So I asked, if there's racism in Thailand, why aren't we holding the school officials accountable if this is happening to children? This proclamation doesn't do that. If it's happening at the town hall, why aren't we holding the town um, the town leadership accountable? If this racism in this town, which I'm sure there is, I'm sure Kenny's experienced it. I'm sure. At some point, my son might experience it. But why don't we call it out for what it is and deal with those people in those situations? Because this proclamation does nothing. It's a political hit job. So we can say, look, we did something. If this young lady's son is dealing with racism, then why isn't everybody at the superintendent's office asking why this is happening? Don't come on here with some proclamation that has zero teeth. It will do absolutely nothing. Do something about it. Proclamations do zero. They're not law. They don't allow you to do anything. Besides, look at we did. We joined the rest of the state. We joined the rest of the country. Who cares about them? This is Thailand. So if we have systemic racism in this town, then let's deal with it. But if we don't, don't then these proclamations are useless. The superintendent's on the meeting tonight. If there's an issue, then everybody should be at his door. The town manager's on the meeting tonight. If there's, if there's issues with racism with town employees, they, everybody should be at his door. But this proclamation, this is garbage. It does nothing. It'll never help my child. I can assure you of that. It'll never help my wife. I can assure you of that. And to be spoken to tonight by 99% people that are white telling me about racism and, and, I'm sorry, in my opinion, it's crap. So if, if we want to do something about it, let's do something. But making a proclamation does nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Karen. Yes, hi, thanks Tammy. Uh, Karen Moran, 50 Merlot Way. Um, I did write into the council um, late this afternoon, so some of you may not have gotten a chance to read my email, but um, I did support a proclamation around uh, declaring racism a public health crisis here in Tallinn. We do have racism here. I've heard it from my neighbors. This is not a school problem. This is a community problem. It is a shared responsibility of this community. If you are uncomfortable, good. It's time for everyone to be uncomfortable. A proclamation in my mind tells me that this town council is, commit, is committing to this idea 
and to put some things in place that will help this community get through it. I, I don't know what else to say, but if you think there's not a problem here, you need to talk to some more people. And if the mother of a child is telling us that there's racism here, that's not a school problem. It is a community problem because that child's being taught something. Not in the schools necessarily. So uh, I think we need to talk about shared responsibility more here in Tallinn because I, I, don't, I don't hear it. We all share in this responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kenny, I see your hand is up again. We don't usually do two, um, like you have the two minute limit and we don't like have it so you come back up again, but we do have participation at the end of the meeting. Um, if you wanted to talk then again, um, anybody else? Um, I'm assuming that's Marilee. Just says BB though, BBM. Oh, the hand went down, but you might still be muted, Marilee, if, if that's you. Sorry, everybody. I'm trying to unmute myself. Oh, no worries. My sorry, I was I was on mute, um, and I I apologize for the delay. Um, so my name is Marilee Beebe. I'm at 90 Roads Road um, in Tolland, and I've I've listened to uh, the other comments here tonight, and I just want to put it on the record that I support the request for a pro proclamation to recognize that racism is a public health issue. Um, this is one of the things that Tolland can do to stand in solidarity solidarity with our BIPOC uh, fellow citizens. These people have resoundingly, resoundingly emphasized that racism in all its forms, both overt and subtle, is affecting their emotional, their physical, um, and their mental well-being. Um, we need to listen to our BIPOC fellow citizens. We need to empathize and we need to act. And we need to do so as a community and I think that this resolution helps us to take one small step forward to do that. It's not, as uh, Karen suggested, a town hall issue. It's not a town council issue. It's not a school issue. It's a community issue. And this is just one statement that says, we stand in solidarity with you and we will move this forward and we will try to address um, systemic injustice. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Uh, Bob. Thank you, Tammy. Uh, Bob Rubino, 296 Weigold Road. I'm sorry, I joined a little bit late, so uh, I'm going to direct my comments uh, to the proclamation uh, of January 6th. So if I'm repeating anyone's other comments, please, uh, please excuse me. Uh, Thank you very much for considering uh, the language that I had sent in for the proclamation uh, regarding the events of January 6. Uh, you know, people say that politics, uh, all politics are local. And although the language of the proclamation is directed to the events that happened in Washington, DC, I think it's really important uh, that we in Tolland at least reaffirm uh, the process why, whereby uh, we elect our representatives. And that, uh, you know, one way or the other, uh, we have elections, there are winners and there are losers. And it's a process. And I, I think this proclamation at least sets the tone within Tolland of a respectful dialogue and discourse of political discussion, one way or the other, of whether you're for something or you're against something, uh, let us at least commit that we will respectfully uh, discuss these things. And the events of January 6th are just not American. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Um, okay. Um, anybody else? If anybody else having issues with their computer and cannot raise their hand, I'm going to do a quick browse through to see if anybody is raising hands. Uh, I don't see anybody. All right. Um, thank you for your participation. Now um, we will go on to uh, number four, as stated on the meeting, proclamations and presentations. Um, we have two proclamations before us tonight, 4.1. Proclamation request condemning the January 6th attack on our national capital and a proclamation request regarding racism as a public health emergency. Um, okay, so the process as it stands is, well, this is, this is a, it's kind of a, well, Madam Chair, I'm sorry, as a point of order, uh, if I may be heard on this issue. Um, okay. Uh, again, as uh, I'm bringing up this as a point of order where uh, I would object to this proposal being brought forward for consideration by the council as the what's been included as the agenda items 4.1 and 4.2. I don't even really request for proclamations, but in essence, I request for resolutions and specific action be undertaken by the council. And although this sounds like semantics, it's really not uh, that by history and practice proclamations issued by the town council are honorary, laudatory, non-political recognition issued to a specific town resident or a specific town organization for outstanding commendable achievements that may have been gone, otherwise gone unnoticed by the town. Or it's a specific declaration that's required by law or by code. The proclamation request submitted to the town council in items 4.1 and 4.2 don't fit this criteria and that they request for specific actions that carry legal ramifications and obligations. And moreover, are merely attempts to use the proclamation process to intentionally circumvent the proper channels reserved for handling such matters. That, that the action, in order for any action to be taken in accordance with these, to these proclamations, this is more properly a resolution and that, the, that any action taken by the town council that carries with the pronouncement of any official position or policy or carries any potential legal obligations to the town must be done by resolution. And that if any town council member would like to bring these matters up uh, for a proposal as a resolution, they can do that for a future meeting under uh, pursuant to town code A uh, section A175-1 paren F paren one. But in the present form as presented before the town council, these are not proper requests or proclamations, nor are they resolutions that are before the town council at this point. So as such, I would respectfully uh, object to these items being dealt with as proclamations. And I formally make a motion that they be marked off the agenda to be possibly reclaimed at a later point as a resolution, if anybody so chooses. So you're making a motion then? Yes, yes, Madam Chair, I'm making a motion that these matters be marked off as these are not proper requests for proclamations and that they don't meet the criteria. They don't specify a specific person or organization. They do not specify any, anything that would fall under the normal parameters of a proclamation and they carry with them legal obligations or official policy pronouncements of the town, which can only be done through resolution. So yes, I object and I formally move that these be marked off as not proper proclamations. Okay. Um, is there a second to that motion? Kirk Center, I'll second that motion. Okay, um, discussion? Uh, Brenda Felici, I'd like to point out that we have previously done proclamations for things like LGBTQ uh, Pride Month, Fair Housing Month. Um, so there is precedent for doing uh, proclamations for segments of our uh, community to highlight um, accomplishments or um, injustices done to segments of our community um, for highlighting where our marginalized members of our community need our attention and our assistance. And I believe that at least the um, racism as a public health emergency fits what we have previously done for the town council. Um, I'd have to take a little bit more to think about the other one, um, but I'm pretty sure it 
it still falls under that we have precedence of doing this before with this town council. Well, fair housing we're required to do. That one mm -hmm. is different. So I, I, I think that's a that's a requirement for the fair housing community there. Um, Lou? Thank you, Madam Chair, that I would respectfully disagree with uh, Chair, uh, with uh, Councilman Felusi, that the one that was issued for the LGBTQ was specifically issued to the student organization in recognition of Pride Month. And that was done in, uh, it, and that was done, yes, by this board, but it was done to a, directed to a specific organization for a specific purpose. Furthermore, that the proclamation did not carry with it legal ramifications that we, if we're going to discuss this later on, that this proclamation carries with it a declaration as a public health emergency, which is carries with it legal ramifications that, and uh, under such, as, as we have seen in, uh, under the COVID, uh, uh, COVID crisis, when you declare something a public health emergency, that carries with the legal, uh, legal ramifications and other actions, which cannot be done through a proclamation, can only be done through a resolution. So as such, I still stand by my objection and, uh, and, and I would ask that it be acted upon. Thank you. Um, any other uh, council members? Yes, this is uh, Brenda. Uh, Brenda you have to wait until we go all the way around with everybody. You went back to Lou. He, Lou's spoken twice. He made the motion and now he spoke for discussion. Yes, yeah, we still have a, a way that we're supposed to, I'll wait till the end then, but I have something to read. Thank you. Steve? Sorry about that, I was muted. So I just wanna clarify what, what the motion that is being made, is, is it impacting both 4.1 and 4.2? Are we voting for each separately and do we need to vote for each separately? Um, I think the motion was to strike them both. That was, yeah. That's the motion that's on the table and seconded right now. And that, and that was a strike, not the table. I Sorry, I'm just trying to, it, it was pretty fast spoken. So if, if through you, um, Chairman Nuccio, if I can ask um, the proposal proposer of the motion, Councilor Luba, just to clarify if it was being completely stricken from the agenda or if it's being requested to be tabled and reconsidered as a resolution. Well, thank you, uh, thank you uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Jones that my request is that it be struck at this point. And if somebody chooses at a later point to make a request formally for it to be considered as a resolution in accordance with the town code requirements for such, a, for such requests, then, then that's something that we can address at the appropriate time. Again, that that's uh, at the discretion of the chair, that doesn't mean that it needs to be, that it has to be acted upon. But I am asking that, the mo uh, that, my, that my motion is that they be struck as Proclamations. Does that clarify for you, Steve? Y yes. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Yes, um, that does clarify it a little bit. So I'm just trying to think of my thoughts in terms of this discussion. So I did have concern about utilization of the proclamation process for this request, only in that we've in the past, in regards to other policy issues, such as tolls and other state issues, we've had multiple residents request us to, to make proclamations or resolutions op opposing certain state policies. And I'm concerned that when we opposed those in the past, it was because we didn't want to set a precedent. And I'm worried that if we set a precedent, it opens a floodgate for what has been a fairly limited request for proclamations. Um, that being said, I do, I do agree and believe racism is a problem. I think systemic racism is an issue in our state, in our country, and we have to work together. I was proud of the fact that we worked together with the library foundation and the town manager's office to um, host inclusive events, both in terms of LGBTQ as well as racial discrimination and inclusion based events. And I hope that we can continue to do more so. And I don't know if this is an appropriate time to mention um, Chair Minuccio, but I believe, you know, after these requests came in, there was discussion between leadership and town manager's office to try and establish a statement Yes, uh, to you know that was that was one of my points of feedback here is in regards to the January 6th actions, both you and I made statements the last meeting and during proclamations we can open that up to anybody else who wants to make a statement on that. And for the um, proclamation for racism, leaderships, the vice chair and myself um, have been working on coming up with a joint statement that is on the agenda for the next meeting for us to discuss 
as a, uh, a joint statement from the town council. And then we hope to have that statement go to the Board of Ed and Planning and Zoning, both the other elected um, bodies to see if they would like to join in on that statement. So we were already working on something, as you said, um, prior to the proclamation request coming in. And I agree with you. I feel like the proclamation process here that we put in place was a recognition mechanism um, and not a way to uh, induce policy or um, resolutions or declarations. You know, that goes through regular business and not, um, not proclamations in my opinion. So uh, I understand what you're saying. I understand what Mr. Lube is saying. Um, anybody else on council have uh, anything that they want to say at this time regarding the motion that is on the table? Any more discussion for it? Yes. Um, Cassandra? I agree with Councilman uh, Luluba that it should not be a proclamation, but that we should address this differently and that his uh, justification for that, making that it, it has legal ramifications based on other towns that have rejected proclamations of racism being emergency health crisis like Orange, Connecticut. They rejected it as a proclamation because their attorney as well as other legal counsel had recommended that it does open up the floodgates to legal processes that we may not like. Thank you. Um, John? Thank you, Madam Chair. So I was a little stuck procedurally on this issue. Um, so I don't want to sit here and, and vote no on this because judging from the amount of email we've gotten on both sides of this issue, judging from the amount of uh, people that have spoken up on this issue, uh, I, I would like to address it from my personal standpoint. I will wait until petitions from council persons to do that. But um, as far as I can tell procedurally, uh, I do agree with Mr. Luba. Thank you. Um... Kurt? Uh, thank you, Council, uh, Chairwoman Nuccio. Um, I, I'm also going to echo uh, Lou Lubu's uh, sentiment. Um, that's why I seconded his motion. Um, this is uh, not what our proclamation policy is for. Um, and I believe it's been usurped for other issues. Um, these are discussions that do need to be had, um, but not through this uh, means. And I, I do look forward to having those in the future. Thank you. Uh, Brenda? Okay, Brenda Felusi. Um, I'd like to point out that the proclamation that we have published on our webpage, Talon.org, under the town council and listed as previous proclamation, is not for a specific group. It states, whereas the town of Talon is a welcoming community and an exceptional place to live, work, play, and raise a family, and whereas the town of Talon recognizes the importance of equality and freedom, and whereas the nation was founded upon and is guided by a set of principles that includes that every person has been created equal and that each has rights of their life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, and that each shall be accorded to the full recognition and protection of the law. And whereas lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer communities are an integral part of Talon's population. And whereas the town of Talon is dedicated to fostering acceptance of all its citizens and preventing discrimination and bullying. And whereas the town of Talon celebrates the diversity of its people and the right to live their lives out loud, free of discrimination, fear and prejudice. And where it is imperative that young people in the community, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, feel valued, safe, empowered and supported by their peers, educators and community leaders. And whereas Talon is proud to support and protect the civil rights of the LGBTQ community. Therefore, the town of Talon, on behalf of the citizens proclaimed June 2020 as LGBTQ Pride Month, and it was witnessed and signed. It is not specifically for a group at the town hall or at the, at the high school. It is not specifically for an organization or a person. It is recognizing that this minority group in our town has suffered from discrimination, from bullying, um, in that we value them as part of the community. 
this declaration as racism as a um, health emergency is no different than what we've done in, with this proclamation that we completed in June of 2020. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Steve? Yeah, Steve Jones. So I just wanted to just clarify. I don't know if it's if it's any at any point at this at this juncture, but I just asked those questions of you regarding the joint statements being produced, just because I want to make sure it was asked. Because um, I know that because we're really supposed to focus on the motion in hand, I didn't want to speak out of turn. Um, in re in regards to it, um, I'm I'm very divided. I think ultimately we do want to say something. And I hope that in terms of item 4.2, we do come to a unifying statement that can not only be stated by the council as a whole, as a single body um, in a bipartisan manner, but that it does make its way to the Board of Education and Planning and Zoning Commission to be uni a unifying statement of our community. Um, in addition, you know, I, I do encourage any other council members that did not speak on January, the January 6th events if they wish to not forcing you, you know, of course, everyone has the right to or to not speak, but um, I guess I'll just again reiterate that it was a very tragic day for democracy. And I feel that it's important that we not only uphold a fair transition of power at so many levels, but that we recognize all the poll workers in our community that helped, you know, through a pandemic um, support a peaceful election process. Thank you, Steve. Um, Lou. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't think that anybody disagrees that the racism is an issue. And I don't think that anyone disagrees that there is a problem or that the or what occurred on uh, at the Capitol, it was a horrendous event. I'm not, I don't mean to speak for anybody, but I think that that's something that we all agree on. But that's not the issue. The issue here is the proclamation. And I would, I, I respectfully disagree with, uh, with Councilwoman Pelosi again, where the the proclamation that she read during our discussion, the discussion was specifically, it was going to be presented in honor to the uh, GSA uh, association at the high school. That was the purpose for it because we recognize that we cannot issue just a blanket proclamation without somebody, without it being recognized or presented to a specific organization or person. Furthermore, that proclamation does not carry with it the request for a declaration of a public health emergency, which carries again with it statutory and legal requirements, as well as authorities, as well as obligations. So that is why that this is not appropriate for either one of these, because also for the uh, for the requested um, re the other the other requested proclamation that it requests a resolution and an official policy pronouncement, which again that that is not something that is appropriate for a proclamation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Cassandra. I'd just like to say that I think Steve made a good point that, mm -hmm. and a, a, a lot of counselors made a good point, but I don't think anyone is in this agreement here that racism is not an issue. I, you know, anyone who says that they don't see racism is not probably seeing it for whatever reasons it may be. But obviously it does exist and I think that we should do our best to potentially create a statement that in company that encompasses what we stand against racism and we can stand against other things but I disagree that both of these should be proclamations so if we can rework this to be statements from town council just similar to other statements that have been made I think that would be most appropriate for both these situations thank you um so it's like everybody's done. So uh, obviously racism is a very real issue. Um, if, you've, if you've taken time to read or educate yourself on this, there's been a lot of systemic things that have happened throughout history that have perpetuated um, communities of color being treated differently, which have then perpetuated health issues and redlining and housing issues and, and a million other things that come along with it. Um, my issue with this proclamation being what it is, is to me, um, well, first, I took a lot of time to go and talk to people. I have family members that are um, people of color. I've got a lot of friends that are people of color. I grew up in a lot of towns that were not Tolland. Um, I didn't move to Tolland until I was in high school. So I know a lot of people and I talked to a lot of people and 
my problem with this, as somebody had said it before, is this is a proclamation without teeth. Um, we have to look at what we can do at a town level, what we can influence at a town level, and what we can influence at a state level. And um, there's a lot of things that are happening at the state level right now that you know I'm part of that I'm talking about regarding um, affordable access to health care, especially for depressed communities, um, cities, communities of color, um, mental health access, telehealth access, the, the impact of high cost of health care. There's a lot of stuff that's being discussed at a state level where we can make change and where we can impact that change. Um, here in Tolland, I think we need to focus on what we can do here in our town. Because um, that's, that's what a town council is for. If you look up the actual definition of a town council, it is to handle services and um, things that, that happen in the town. Um, so there's a lot of work that is to be done here. And like I had said, Steve and I have been talking quite a bit on coming up with a statement that we feel we can bring to the council for debate, for discussion, and then hopefully for um, consideration and vote on that we can then share with the other elected boards um, because you know racism crosses every line, um, whether it's in planning and zoning or in education or in anything. So making sure that all of us um, come together as elected officials to put our, um, put, our, put our words here and make sure that they matter is, is something that Steve and I have been working on trying to do. And as I said, it's, it's on the next agenda. The statement, we think we've gotten it down to something that we're comfortable bringing forward for debate. And we'll do that. Um, I have to say that I agree with, uh, with what's been said here. The proclamation policy here, I feel like it's, uh, it's being used to subvert that conversation, to not have that conversation, um, and to um, put it through a proclamation. And some of the words for these proclamations are, we the town of, and I don't feel like we can say we the town of for this. Everything that has come in, I went back and counted all of the emails on both sides and I have 21 emails of people that are for it and 22 emails of people that are against it. That is 43 emails out of 12,233 registered voters and 15,000 um, residents of town. So I think we have to, um, we have to bring this back in, in a different format, not through a proclamation and we can discuss it as a council and come up with a statement or decide at that point if we want to do a resolution or um, a statement and then figure out how we get that get that buy-in from our other other boards so if there is any other discussion um, from a town councilor um, Luke there's no public participation in this so um, you can talk at the end of the the meeting for public participation again uh, Brenda Yes, thank you. So I want to understand this correctly. Um, the leadership of the town council, um, prior to having a discussion or having a meeting about these proclamations, decided that they wanted to move forward on a statement and uh, have already prepared that statement, um, knowing that this wouldn't pass today and no. have already put it on a future agenda. No, Brenda. Steve and I have been working on this for a couple of weeks. Before it okay, even so it's been, it's been far farther along than just these past two weeks that you guys decided this proclamation uh, for racism as a health emergency wasn't going to go through. I, I just want to make sure I understood why you've made that decision. This wasn't even on the agenda. It had not even been proposed by anybody as a proclamation. We had gotten emails on it, which you are aware of, mm -hmm. and, and I discussed having a statement or something for us to bring forward as leadership from the town council to the town council to discuss in a meeting to actually have a discussion with the town council over the I'm email. I'm taking offense at your tone. Well, I'm taking offense at your tone, Brenda, the way that you started it. You're trying to make it seem like there's some impropriety here that there is not. Yeah. So Steve and I, for a couple of weeks, have been talking about what we can bring forward as leadership, and that's allowed. So there's, we will bring it up when it gets on the agenda, which is the next meeting. So with that, all those in favor of the motion, Brenda? No. Steve? You're muted, Steve. Aye, sorry. Um, John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? 
Aye. And I'm an I, so then this is going to. Yes, yeah, skip me, Tammy. Oh, I even took myself <laughs> off mute ahead of time. I'm sorry. Hi. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Um, so six to one, we will move this off of proclamations. And um, as I said, there will be something on the next town council agenda um, to look at a statement from the town council in regards to um, the emails that we have received. That moves us to uh, number six, public hearing items of which we have none. That gets us to seven A, reports and boards of boards and committees responsible to the council. Uh, Brenda, do you have anything? I buried my list. Hold on one second while I pull it up. Um, okay. Um, sustainable CT. Um, sustainable CT has, um, a program for reimbursing um, towns with events. It's a matching program. Now, taking a look at what was on our agenda for declaring racism as a public health emergency, um, I took a look through what was on sustainable CTs so that we could have some actionable items. Uh, one of the things in systemic racism is us um, participating basically weekly in systemic racism, even though it's unintentional. Every week we bring our garbage to the street, it gets picked up, the solid waste gets picked up and it's taken to a um, waste to energy um, processing plant. Um, as we all know, in those areas, health air quality is low and that's usually low income. So therefore it impacts um, the minorities uh, much more than it does um, our community. So one of the things Sustainable CT does in like four different towns is they take food waste and they compost it. And there's a couple different ways to do that, which is actually pretty exciting. Um, and by using the matching program, we can get the startup costs matched by half. And we can even have um, residents, the town, and then this matching program go in. So there's a very low impact to the residents. By taking the food waste and um, composting it, it reduces our tipping fees. And by reducing our tipping fees, that obviously reduces our taxes. Um, we might have to do a little bit of playing with numbers to find out if this is really just a wash or if we would be reducing the um, taxes significantly. But the great thing, there's already four communities um, that recognize that they were participating in um, the systemic racism. They already, they wanted to ensure that they were going to be green communities um, and that they were participating in equity. So they've already done the work for us and we can take a look at it. So I was really, really um, thrilled to see that that program's there. Um, the startup costs are anywhere between 12 and $15,000. And again, with the matching program, um, the town of Tallinn could only be paying, you know, maybe two to five thousand dollars to start this up, and then by decreasing the tipping fees, it's, you know, saving money each um, each time, um, each budget. So that's sustainable CT. I, um, you know, I'll if whoever wants more information, I'll get that to you. Um, tourism like committee to has that that. That. If you have that, I'd like to huh? see. That. I'd like to see that if you have it. I'd like to understand I, how it would reduce. Right now, it's all handwritten notes because I had a meeting with um, Abe from Sustainable CT on the phone today. Um, but um, the towns that do it are um, like, oh gosh, I'll type them up. Um, it was just a little bit before this meeting, so I'm a little um, still processing it. But it is. But the. Um, the information is on the sustainable CT website. And that's not the only place that we talk about equity. If you look at the sustainable CT website, number one listed item there is equity, equity training, um, reaching equitable solutions, et cetera. So we're part of this program. We should be taking advantage of these things because obviously it's not just helping us create equity. It's helping us create a green and sustainable community um, and it can even save us taxes. So. 
Um, and then, like I said, tourism has not met. We'll be meeting soon. Um, I'm looking for more input from um, them about how to, how, what updates they want for our um, Every Town Has a Story page. Okay, thank you. Uh, it gets us to 7B, uh, reports of town council liaisons. Do you want me to come back to you, Brenda, or do you want to? Oh, I'm fine. This is going to be really short. Planning and zoning was canceled last night because of technical difficulties. Um, our Blake committee met um, for the first time since uh, March of last year. And we got, uh, we created the calendar for this year. We did an update on the open cases that are happening. Now we can't do any penalties because of um, we're in COVID right now. So, but I have to say that um, Jim is absolutely wonderful. And so are the people on the Blight Committee. They are professional, they're responsive, they're caring. They make sure that um, a, a solution is reached and any help that can be had to our community is given. Um, and land acquisition hasn't met, that's it. Thank you. Um, Cassandra? No committees that I represent have met. Okay. Um, Steve? Yes, uh, on January 14th, the Conservation Commission met. Um, Trooper Eklund was a special guest to discuss issues of trespassing, illegal dumping, illegal signage. Um, they're going to be working with the state troopers to provide detailed maps for boundary markers in case future events need to be required. Um, staff is providing updated, uh, they believe stationary or um, written draft letters for abutters so that they're aware that they abut conservation areas, um, as well as trying to find processes that allow for the town as well as Troopsy to address certain instances when they happen, like the illegal dumping of trees that happen on Nedweed, which the core did successfully remove the remainder of the trees after the um, the tree company did take down the majority of them. There were a few left over that the core took care of. So I just wanna thank them for that. Um, and then on the 20th, the Water Commission met. Um, they continue to discuss some of the leak detection issues as well as discuss um, their volume reports and they still remain very profitable. Obviously in these COVID environments, there's a lot more usage of water on the system at home with people working and learning from home, although I think it's let up a little bit due to seasonal changes. And that covers it for me. Thank you. Um, do you know with, with what they're seeing there um, because of COVID and that, is that gonna impact the rates at all? Are they thinking? Um, let me double check the, agenda, the minutes. Um, they did discuss the rate increases that Connecticut Water is proposing. And I don't know if, I don't, I think it was for future discussion on whether or not the rate increases by Connecticut Water would impact their rates and whether or not they would have to do any changes to their rates. I think it's, they said it's been several years since they've done any substantive change to their rates. Okay. But yeah, right now their um, revenues are up about 23,000. Their gross margin is up 70,000. Net income's up 77. And their available cash is up about 231,000 compared to last year. So they've, they've done a pretty good job at maintaining a very steady cash flow and, and savings for emergencies. Okay, thank you. Um, John? WPCA did meet, they were not able to get a quorum though, but they did have a conversation. I was unable to attend, so I'd have to refer you to the minutes for that. And that's all. Thank you. Lou? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, that Birch Grove Building Committee did meet that we did discuss additional uh, uh, additional things going into the, uh, in the uh, school. Uh, we talked about furnishings as well as uh, other, uh, other issues uh, that the project again remains on, uh, on track remains on budget at this point that we will be uh, looking at, uh, that we, we actually did appro approve a uh, list of items that we are going to submit to the state uh, for consideration for reimbursement to see if the state will, re will reimburse these additional items um, that we are going to be waiting to hear from them as far as whether or not reimbursement will be, uh, will be given. And if not, then uh, alternative actions such as grants or other funding uh, revenue sources that uh, I would uh, like to remind everybody, uh, all the town council members, that we are looking for dates for people to come to uh, to tour uh, the uh, the school 
and see uh, some of the uh, some of the rooms that are uh, that are available for viewing. So uh, if we can, if uh, if all the council members could get back to uh, uh, the chair as far as dates that are available, or if Madam Chair, if you could send that out again, uh, so that we can see about getting together a date to present to uh, the uh, construction company, so that we can all go there to tour it. Um, that would be appreciated. Um, I provided that to Katie. Anybody who got back to me, I provided a consolidated list to her of when everybody was available. Okay, and then I will then I will follow up with her to uh, to see what dates uh, that they are that uh, will be that will be doing that. Um, also for uh, this month and for next month, I am uh, the uh, Board of Education liaison, and that uh, the uh, Board of Education has been busy reviewing. The, they've had uh, a special uh, special meeting as well as two other meetings, and there's another meeting tomorrow on the issue of the budget that uh, Dr. Willett is here and that, uh, that they, uh, I believe that they did discuss his proposed budget uh, and had gone over various issues, that there were questions that were posed by, uh, by, uh, by members of the Board of Education regarding the proposed budget, as well as, uh, um, as, well as the, um, the proposed uh, rate increases that that is still being reviewed at by the, uh, by the Financial uh, Committee and uh, that uh, then uh, there'll be further discussions regarding that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Kurt. Oh, sorry about that. Um, I had, had had no meetings since our previous meeting, so I had nothing to report. Okay, um, I had uh, two meetings. I had an Eastern Highland Health District meeting, um, which is, there's a lot of, quite a bit of information there. Uh, we were we spent a lot of time talking about the vaccine um, and the next phase that we're going through and also um, what we expected to see from a rollout and I can tell you at the state level we're thinking that the rollout is going to slow a little bit because of the the numbers that we have coming in I'd also like to point out that state of Connecticut was granted 50,000 more um, doses because we we're doing such a good job of getting people immunized um, but basically 1B right now, what we're registering, we're still handling any, um, any nurse frontline staff, that kind of a thing, but also we are registering and inoculating the 75 plus um, community right now. Next is gonna be the 65 to 74. That has been pushed. We're thinking it's probably gonna be in uh, beginning of February. Uh, after that will be the 16 to 64 with um, known CDC qualified comorbidities. And then um, after that, essential staff. Um, by the time we get through all of those, they're saying uh, that just the sign up period um, is going to go into uh, late March before the essential staff will actually start being signed up. So there's the next three classifications. They're trying to have the sign up about every two weeks. Um, and we are also looking at uh, a lot of the issues that we're seeing, especially for our seniors. And um, I see Bev just got on. I'm hoping we can kind of have a discussion on what we're, we're doing here in Tolland. But especially with the 75 plus community, technology is not their strong suit um, in getting people signed up in the VAM system. Um, the VAM system definitely has its issues. Uh, it requires an email for each person. It requires an email back to check and validate. Um, but you do not need the QR code that gets sent back once you're registered, your name is put on the list of the location that you go to. Very key piece of information though is that um, our health district is going to have um, vaccines available at the Mansfield Community Center, which is up by EO Smith. They're going to be doing one large vaccine um, outing at, at EO Smith. So the weekly schedule um, goes up on Friday that is when the, um, the vaccines are released, when the vaccine dates are released. So if you want to be anywhere local, we're suggesting that you unfortunately wait to Friday to see what pops up for availability. Otherwise, unfortunately, we're looking at East Hartford, Rensselaer Field, uh, and some of the larger hospital areas that have the vaccine. Um, so if we have somebody who's local, more close to home or has transportation issues, uh, we wanna try to get them into the Mansfield Community Center. They're being conservative right now with the amount of um, appointments that they have because they're supposed to get 400 doses, but sometimes they only get 200 doses or maybe 150 doses. There's no guarantee on how many we're going to get. So we're just asking that people um, be vigilant and be patient and reach out um, if you have a problem. 
they have been successful in recruiting yet another volunteers for the, uh, the Medical Reserve Corps, which is good, which will help from a vaccine perspective. And um, I think that was the, the gist of the majority of the meeting that, that we had um, in terms of relevance for this. And then I had uh, a meeting of the day on, uh, for the Commission on People with Disabilities. They're working on the survey that is gonna be put out. Uh, it's a state survey, but Tallinn residents will be able to answer and, um, and indicate that they're from Tallinn. We're gonna gather those results so we can start looking at the needs assessment on what this community feels like they have for needs. Um, we'll be able to use that to kind of direct what this commission is gonna be working on. Um, and we are having Dial Ride come to a meeting to kind of give us a more, a better in-depth understanding of what they do and how they help us. Right now, there's a lot of issues with dial ride because of COVID. They can only take one person on the bus at a time, which limits it. So we're, we're gonna try to see what we can do to um, understand their plight and see what other towns we can kind of band with to, to look for some increased uh, opportunity there for our uh, senior and disabled population, uh, people with disabilities, sorry. Um, and Steve, you have a question? Yeah, sorry if I missed it. Regarding the Eastern Highland Health District meeting, was there any discussion about the possibility of a regional um, vaccination site within our, our district? I know that I think there have been some discussions during the testing site area that there was a possibility that health officials were interested in use, utilizing the high school location for that. Uh, right now, they're focusing it on Mansfield, um, okay. Mansfield Community Center. Um, we did talk, oh, Mike, you know, we, we mentioned briefly about whether or not we were going to see them in town or in um, local drugstores. Of course, we don't really have a local drugstore here. We have Big Y, but I don't know that Big Y is going to be doing these kinds of um, vaccines. We did ask about that, especially some of the other towns did, but I think right now they're just focusing in on Mansfield and, and then having the larger event that's going to be at EO Smith. But Mike, do you remember? Yeah, I was going to say they also pointed, even though it's not part of the uh, Eastern Highlands Health District, they mentioned that Vernon Rockville Hospital is going to be a large vaccination site. Uh, and Mansfield is actually in our health district area. So um, okay. that's the one they're targeting for um, our, our area for now. Um, I think it's a lot of it is frankly still being sorted out. So it's still kind of early days. And I know, uh, as mentioned earlier on the municipal side, you know, Mike Wilkinson and I in our office are trying to figure out when the time is right, how we're going to upload everybody into VAMS. And, you know, we're kind of uh, absorbing the guidance as it's coming through. So it's very piecemeal right now. But, uh, you know, we have been putting information out on the town website. Uh, if people are 75 plus and, and soon to be the category of 65 plus, uh, you can get into that system and we're trying to figure out ways where we can proactively help them. And I know, uh, you know, I've had conversations with the human services director on that about if there's any way we can proactively reach out to some of the folks that, you know, frequent the senior center. Thanks. And that was something that I had, um, that I had, we had talked about in the Eastern Highland Health District too, um, was possibly utilizing BEV or, um, you know, in other towns there, obviously their directors to talk about um, how do we reach out to the people to make sure everybody knows, because there's also a phone line that you can call if you don't have computer access, but it has been inundated and it is taking days for them to get back to people. So again, the, the program that's in place is just hard and not uh, very user-friendly. So my concern is making sure that we're doing everything we can, whether it's voter rolls or whatever, to reach out to as many people as we can to see if they need help and how do we do that? Um, can we utilize uh, the, the, our new senior director and Becky, you know, to kind of reach out to people and make sure that um, as many people as we can get here in Tallinn are registered and, and getting the vaccine if they want it. Um, I'd just like Thank to you. add to that, if I may. Um, again, this is right over the line over in Vernon, but um, some of the faith communities have been contacted by the town of Vernon and um, we are yoked or I'm sorry, um, our parish, St. Bernard's and St. Matthew's are um, together as one parish. So if you go to Blessed Sacrament, check your email because they are having a vaccine clinic uh, for people 75 and older this week. Do they have to, do they have a registration for that? Are they limited in the amounts and are they limited to just yes. people of Vernon? They're limited to the, to the members of um, the Blessed Sacrament, Sacrament Parish. 
but that's a very large portion of our um, both the Vernon and Tallinn community. So um, thank you for that. Um, that's all that I have. Uh, that gets us to new business 8.1 consideration of a resolution which amends the program income plan for the from the original activity, the Tolland Housing Rehabilitation Loan Program. So this oh. one looked a little, uh, this one looked a little tricky. So uh, I see you've got Bev on. Yes. Good evening. Okay. Hi, Mike Rosen, Town Manager. Uh, I uh, eight point one and eight point two go together hand in hand. So you'll see in your packet materials a lot of the same language is used for both eight one and eight two, but they're uh, sequenced. We have to do eight one and then we can do eight two after. Uh, I, frankly, I'm going to yield the floor to Bev. Um, she's on her uh, phone device, so. Uh, make sure we speak loud and clear um, to her because you know, she's following along from home. So, Bev, can you hear us and can you uh, say hello? Yeah, can you hear okay, me? Okay, good, can great. You All yours. Okay. Okay, and I'm also watching you on cable TV, which is a little odd. Uh, That's so weird. It's kind of delayed. Yeah, it's kind of delayed listening to you. But um, the Housing Rehab Program Loan Program has been around since 1991. Um, the funding originates from HUD and it's passed through the states. And currently, the Department of Housing administers the programs. So we have, over the years, gotten eight different grants um, for a tune of almost $3 million. Um, we've Eligible recipients in town have applied for those funds. It's a 0% loan program. Um, they must meet certain HUD guidelines and be up to date on the mortgage and taxes. The program um, helps to fix uh, safety and public code violations and, you know, common home repairs, septic systems, well repairs, roofing, and siding with a spending cap of 35000 So with that program, um, people reimburse the town um, through either paying it off when their, their home is, uh, when they sell their property or through payments um, over a 10-year period. It's put into a separate account, um, which Lisa and her staff manage. Um, the state, um, the housing rehab program right now has a total of about 149,000 in it. And the request for housing rehab has slowed uh, primarily because of the COVID and the weather conditions. Um, at the same time, I've become aware over the years that Old Post Village was in need of an upgrade to the fire system. And their current generator is a manual generator, which must be started by hand. Um, therefore, a commercial generator and a transfer switch is necessary. In the past, Old Post Village didn't have the capital funds for the improvements or the capacity to identify the scope of work or attain professional cost estimates. So working with elderly housing management and a con community consultant who manages the housing program for us, we were able to determine the cost estimates for both improvements, which would come up to about 130,000. Uh, the state will allow us to uh, change the use of program income from housing rehab, rehab to this program, um, but they require us to do certain steps. Um, and one of them is the two motions that are, um, the two resolutions that are on the agenda tonight. So I Thank can answer any other questions you might have of them. So um, can you then just clarify, so will this be a grant or a loan, or are we using established money? It, it's established money. It will be, a, in a sense, a grant to them. It's established money. It's part of that 149, 149,000 of program income we have. Okay. Um, does anybody have any so questions? How, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Beth. I was going to say, and the state has kind of changed their, their policies, and probably Lisa can attest to this too because she went through the training, is that now they're requiring towns, if you have more than 50000 that you return the money to them if you don't use it within a few months. And so this is another way for us to utilize the small city funding still in our own community. And I know Old Post Village the, um, has many... Um, you know, infrastructure needs there. They do. They have a lot of stuff that that they've been working on yeah. with their, their capital plan. And um, yeah, by keep, keeping the rents low, that also prohibits yeah. a lot of work that they can do. So 
um, in manual generators, that's just, that's not good for that community. Um, now, and the fire marshal has for years come to my office and say, ask, is there anything we could do about the fire um, alarm system? So, um, you know, John and his, his guys are very supportive of this. So this would definitely support that. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions of Beth? All right then, Steve. All right, I would make a motion that now therefore be resolved by the Tallinn Town Council that one, that it, that it is cognizant of the conditions for the use of the program income as prescribed by Title 24, Part 570, Section 489E of the Code of Federal Regulations. Two, that it realizes program income is governed by the Title I of Housing and Community Development Act 1974. Three, that it may use program income only for the following activities. A, the activity that generated the program income if the activity continues to meet the requirements of Title I of the Housing and Community Development Act 1974. Or B, any additional activity that meets the requirements of Title I of the Housing and Community Development Act if the town receives DOH's written approval to fund with program income. Four, that it may use program income to fund administrative and program soft costs within the following limits. Administrative costs, 8%. Total administrative and program soft costs, housing and rehabilitation activities only, 12%. Total administrative and soft costs, all activities except for housing rehabilitation, 20%. And five, that it hereby amending the program income plan that has was adopted for the original activity that generated the program income to permit the funding of additional activities from the program income or from that program income approved by the Tallinn Town Council on January 26, 2021. Move about second it. Okay, any discussion? Yeah, you need to drink after that one, Steve. <laughs> any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Uh, Brenda? Bye. Cassandra? Aye. Didn't skip you this time. John? Oh, the I. <laughs> Aye. Uh, oh, look at you're all getting ahead of me. That was John, right? Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. Apparently, I don't even have to ask anymore. You guys are all set. I'm an eye on that. So uh, that passes unanimously. Thank you. So let's uh, review the language of eight. I think actually, Steve, you can probably just make a motion for 8.2 since it's just the. Um, Improving what we just amended. Yeah, sure. If, if no one, no one is. Um, we'll make a motion, and then we can. If anybody has anything we can discuss. All right. So, item eight point two, draft resolution. I would I would make a motion that whereas the program income is defined in federal regulation at twenty four CFR five seventy point four eighty nine E, which specify that program income is the gross income received by the jurisdiction that has been directly generated from the use of the community development block grant, whereas examples of program income include payments of principal and interest in housing rehabilitation loans made using the community development block grant funds, interest earned on program income pending its disposition, and interest earned on funds that have been placed in a revolving loan account, whereas one revolving loan account, RLA or PI account has been established to utilize the town of Tallinn's program income. Whereas 100% of all program income derived from housing rehabilitation within the town of Tallinn will be deposited into the town of Tallinn's revolving loan account. Whereas program income during a program year, July 1st through June 30th will be used again for the same activity from which it was derived, housing rehabilitation within the town of Tallinn. Whereas program income funds in the amount of 130,000 will be allocated for the generator and fire alarm replacement at Old Post Village. Whereas program income funds in excess of 30,000 during a program year of July 1st through the third, June 30th may be allocated for public housing modernization within the town of Tallinn. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the town council that following program income plan it hereby approved and further authorizes town manager Michael Rosen to sign such document. Certified as a true copy of the resolution adopted by Tallinn, town of Tallinn at its meeting of its town council on January 26, 2020 and which has not been modified or rescinded in any way whatsoever. Move, move, I'll second that. Any discussion? Uh, Brenda? All those in, sorry, all those in favor. Brenda? Aye. Sorry. Cassandra? Aye. Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Lou? 
Aye. Hurt. Aye. I have an aye, so that passes unanimously. Thank you, Bev. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gets us to 8.3, Discuss discussion of a proposal from Advanced CT. Okay, I can get us started. Hi, uh, Mike Rosen, Town Manager. Um, so if uh, Council remembers back in October of 2020, uh, October 27th to be exact, we had a presentation from a representative from Advanced CT that came to speak about some of the services that they provide to communities that partner with Advanced CT. Uh, I think what we spent, a, we had a nice presentation from uh, Courtney who, who visited us that evening. And uh, it, we talked everything about the, what is economic development? Uh, what is your reputation in the economic development marketplace? Uh, business perspective on local government, placemaking. And then it sort of ended in a conversation about this idea about Site Finder. And Site Finder is uh, a program, I'm not, it's a, a software that um, is Connecticut's online database of available commercial properties. So brokers, economic developers, and end users can post and search for retail, office, industrial, investment, and specialty real estate online. And Advanced CT, we would have, through Advanced CT, we would have access um, to this to be able to um, post uh, any private developments that don't have their own representation through a realtor or a broker or any public lands that we might wanna market in this fashion. So the good, the, the timing on this was actually fortuitous because I, I just received this proposal, which was a follow-up to our October conversation about a week or so ago, we, or two weeks ago when, when we were um, figuring out the last agenda. And we mentioned this at our last council meeting that this had just come through. And uh, it's also budget season right now. And especially as this would be a recurring operating cost uh, of about $2,000 a year. And as I'm preparing the operating budget and going through all my budget deliberations right now internally, I thought it would be a good chance to workshop this idea to the town council now so that I know which way you're thinking about this. So I know whether or not to include this in next year's budget. Um, the proposal that Courtney provided to me, uh, she goes into a little bit about what the $2,000 would buy the town. Um, so there's the site finder plus, which we just talked about. Um, we can upload town owned properties as well as those not listed in the database for viewing by anyone, like any realtor or any broker um, to seek out commercial real estate opportunities in Connecticut. Um, they would also provide economic development commission support. So they would come to the EDC to ensure that the group uh, maximizes its impact on Tallinn's business community, uh, brainstorming potential action items and creating an outline for a whole year's worth of activities. Uh, and then, you know, th so we do have a, a, an active EDC, but I guess this would sort of be, uh, you know, a, 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 a inspiring conversation with them and trying to uh, figure, fine tune what they're trying to do year by year. So um, it's $2,000 is obviously a significant uh, amount of money enough that, you know, I wanted to make sure that I would, you were on board before I just put this in the budget. And, um, you know, since we did all meet with Courtney back in October, I wasn't sure how you felt about this um, uh, request. So I leave it up to you and see what you think. Thanks. Thank you. So, um, this was one of our agenda, not one of our agenda, this was one of our goal items, which was to um, look at outside brokerage firms or some kind of firm to help us uh, with economic development and advertising for uh, the available lands that are in town. And I will freely admit that this was one that I was kind of a little bit of a bulldog on. I'm sure Kurt will see he's going to make that face right there. He's making that face. He knows. So, um, you know, my intent was always to try to find a way to advertise what we have here in Tallinn and try to get some business um, in. So I had looked at the site finder. We had Courtney come in and talk about it and that, but I'll be the very first one here instead of the last one to say that um, I feel like everything that she went over um, is already happening. The, all the property that is available in town with the exception of one small lot of land at the industrial park is privately owned land. And they're all being handled by real estate brokers. And they pretty much said that all of those pieces of land were already on site finder. So um, they're doing it anyway. Um, 
So I, I, I don't necessarily know that I still see value in, in what uh, they wanted to do for $2,000 if it's already occurring. And our one little piece of property to me is, um, I don't know that $2,000 to get it on there is, um, is a good spend. So Kurt, I will let you, oh, I'm sorry. I can't let you be Brenda the one to say, I told you so. Um, we're gonna go to Brenda. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just had a um, some clarifying questions. This is for both lease and sale of properties, correct? That can be listed there. So in one place, it looks like it's only for sale. In one place, it looks like it can be lease or sale. So I just wanted yeah. to clear that up. I think it's both, right, Mike? I think it's been basically any any property that's available for I was there rent on there too? Like like if if they wanna if if like the place that's open where it used to be the gym, I think um that could be listed there. Right. It says like at the top it says available commercial properties, but it doesn't say available for what. But farther down it says um update the status, whether it's you know still for sale, lease, sale, lease, pending, etc. That doesn't let me know if properties that are just for lease or just for rent can be on this program. Um, and I tried looking back at my notes from our October meeting and I didn't find any information there. Um, the other thing is, have we looked or reached out to um, our property owners our, our, um, to see if they want to partner with us in this? Um, because like uh, Tammy has said, there's only one um, Talon property available right now. Um, if there's going to be a number of other property owner or other commercial owners that want to be involved with this, I'm interested in, in finding out how many and if it's really going to be beneficial. Um, rather have, you know, people in empty spaces than not. Um, so you're thinking like a private, a private public yeah. partnership kind of a thing? Right, because it does it does say in here that you can have. I don't. I just lost it, but it does say in here that you can have um, other property owners list with you. So you know, um, and the other concern I have is right now um, our planning department is, uh, you know, not fully staffed. Um, so I wouldn't want to enter into an agreement when we don't have people to be able to, um, you know, to, to use this. Like I wouldn't say, let's go ahead and sign on for this now. And then it's gonna be three months before our planner can get up and running and put this stuff on, then that's just a waste of our time. So if, if we do go forward, I just wanna make sure that the timing on it uh, will have the uh, equity to invest in this investment. The $2,000 is for a year, correct, Mike? It's it's a for a year per year. Yep. Yeah, it's yep. A year. Okay. Right. But I don't I don't want to miss three months of that year. Right. You know, if nobody's there to to use it. So, yeah. Um, go ahead, Kurt. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chairwoman of the ATL. Uh, now, I have been an outspoken uh, proponent or opponent of this uh, idea, um, although I'm not going to dwell on that too much, but I, I would like um, just ask a question to Mike. Um, I, I was kind of intrigued by their uh, proposal for um, assisting the EDC. Um, I, I know the EDC we have now is a tremendous group of people and they're doing an extraordinary job, but um, you know, that's something I would like to explore with them. I believe they have a meeting the first week of February, so something we can talk about. Um, I think you'll probably be there, right, Mike? So I would, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's something we can talk about with them if they could find any value in that. Um, maybe having in some professional outside guidance for a year um, might be very beneficial for the EDC. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so something to talk about. But, uh, that's all I, I, I could I could try to find out if Advanced CT offers that standalone service yeah. without the site finder or if it's a, yeah. a package deal. I can find that out. Okay, and I also I also will find out about if uh, lease versus sale, uh, if there's a distinction or if it's one or the other. Um, so yes, I will I will I will follow up with Courtney after this meeting. Um, Steve. Yes, thank you, Steve Jones. So 
I don't know if you're looking for a straw poll in terms of this. I would say at this time, I'm not in favor of um, incorporating this $2,000 annual fee into our anticipated budget presentation. Um, this may possibly fall under requests from council members, but we did receive a correspondence from a resident, um, I believe Deb Getz, who's on, sent an article. I wasn't able to read the whole thing from the German Choir about um, East Windsor launching an interactive website that lets them do this. I don't know if that's something that's on their town domain or if it's a unique site that they additionally paid for, but I would be curious as to um, reaching out to, to East Windsor and seeing how they went about engaging in this uh, process and what costs were associated, if it's potentially more affordable or more accessible. Um, I saw something come in, but I haven't read the email. So um, I am behind yeah. on that one, but- um, They just mentioned like an, uh, an interactive web-based commercial property listing tool that the town of East Windsor launched. So it's more town development based versus um, the public private partnership. So I'm liking everything that we hear so far. I think asking the EDC is definitely uh, something that we should do. I know that they have a budget um, every year. I don't know that they spend it or I know they have it in the last couple of years because we are gonna use it for um, doing our big business symposium, which we never got to do because of COVID. So they might, ha they might have a use for this. And I definitely like the idea of looking at um, if Windsor has something, the problem is, is we've got a bit of a time crunch for when, Mike, when's your hard stop? When's your hard deadline for? Yeah, yeah we're getting pretty close um, for operating budget. I'd say probably mid-February at the very latest. We, our public hearing is February 11th for the capital budget, but at that point, we're pretty close to having the operating budget complete. All right, so we're going to have to try to move on this one fairly quickly. Um, Lou? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think I would be echoing uh, the same sentiments of uh, uh, Council Member Schenner and uh, Jones that uh, they both basically took the uh, statements that I was going to uh, put forward. If this were to be a straw poll issue that uh, uh, unlike them, I, I think that this is something that I would like to consider having uh, included as this uh, as the, in the upcoming budget for consideration for the mere purpose of where uh, this way it'll be something that we'll, we'll, we'll take into account and that we can uh, utilize if uh, I know that we're talking that right now might not be the perfect time because of the vacancies within the planning com uh, committee. I mean, the planning uh, planning office and other issues regarding EDC, but I would like to at least have those funds available where if it is something that we find is appropriate that we can strike while the iron's hot rather than having to uh, try and figure out a way to pay for something uh, down the road. So um, as I, I, that those are just my feelings. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just typing all this down. Cassandra. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just trying to help Steve out. He said he couldn't read the whole article, but it is confirmed that, well, the article states that in East Windsor, they developed their own tool that they put on their town website that was a database to provide a database for the town and for the public that shows all the submitted properties over time. So it could be something we could reach out to them for and not have to pay as much for potentially so it could save in the budget. Thank, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. So I guess at this time, Mike, um, we're kind of torn. So we've got, Brenda doesn't really have an opinion either way, but is definitely more concerned with whether or not we're going to have the human resources to handle it. Um, Kurt wants to check with EDC and said he wanted to hold right now for not putting it in the budget, I believe. Did I hear you right, Kurt? You don't want to do that yet. You want to wait and see. Um, yeah, I'd like to hear um, back from Mike on if they could be piecemeal or and get EDC's uh, opinions on that. All right, and Steve wants to wait right now. Lou would like to get it in. Cassandra doesn't have an opinion in, on getting it in, but um, I definitely, I'd like to hear from the EDC if it's something that they would be interested in. I'd also like to um, kind of explore what the other town did there and and I recognize Brenda's concern with making sure that we have people that would actually be able to use it. So, um, and sorry. sorry, one one more thing: making sure that there's property that we would want to list there. You know, if mm -hmm. there's open property, but the owner says no, I don't want the town listing it. It's no use for us to go ahead and go through with this, right? 
Yeah, so. it's almost worth it to, I don't know if we can see what's on there now. Because last time when she gave that presentation, I was pretty sure all of our major properties were already on there that were up for sale. They were like the whole TVA area was on there and that the and the land by NERAC was on there. All of the major pieces of property and the one off of um, 68, I think, 69, I think was on there too. So I thought most of our major properties were already listed, but I'd like to like to know that for sure. John. Yeah, um, I'm with you, Tammy and, and Kurt. I'd like to see what the EDC has to say about it and if they have available budget for it too, that would make a difference as well. Yeah, we could do that. Um, I, I will uh, I, I will certainly reach out to uh, Advanced CT after this. I have noted the questions. Um, I'll see what I can drum up and uh, either this will be on the next agenda, if I'll, we'll work with the chair on that, or if it sounds like it's not worthwhile, then we just won't build it into the budget process. But um, I'll, I'll, we'll have an EDC meeting next week and we'll, we'll start there. Uh, I'll verify you know, what the budget is, the line is, if EDC is interested in using that money towards it, et cetera, we'll, we'll, we'll work on it. Perfect. Okay, that gets us to 8.4, potential amendment to section C of town council's rule <clears throat> of procedure. Uh, hi, Mike Rosen, town manager. So um, every two years when a new town council starts, um, they agree upon rules of procedure in order to keep order at town council meetings and also various other uh, things. Uh, it lists out basically the rules of procedure for the two year cycle. Uh, how agendas are laid out, how meetings are posted, uh, personal conduct, and et cetera. You can read in the packet. Uh, this was brought up a few weeks ago um, that there's language currently in section C of the rules of procedure uh, in the fifth paragraph that say, when recognized by the chairperson, the elector shall give his slash her name and address. The words stand, uh, so, Shall, oh, sorry, I read that wrong. Uh, section C, paragraph five. Members of the public shall observe, um, I, I'm, I've just lost my place. Uh, Electors shall stand and give his, her name and address. Electors may speak for up to two minutes under agenda item number five, et cetera. We just had that earlier tonight. But due to the fact there's, there's two things there. One is um, uh, right now we're in the Zoom mode and obviously people are not necessarily standing in their homes when they speak to us. So we don't wanna be out of order with the rules of procedure. Um, so it might be worthwhile to strike the stand and verbiage. But the other thing too, is even in, if we are back in in-person meetings um, to, you know, not that we've ever necessarily enforced or forced this, but uh, per the rules of procedure, we would be asking that person to stand and what happens if they're not able to stand, if they might have a disability or if they're elderly, if, you know, they might not wanna do that for too long. So uh, it's been recommended or at least suggested that council consider uh, removing the phrase stand comma and out of that paragraph. And at any time council can amend its rules of procedure by a two thirds vote. This does not need to go to public hearing. And if you, can, if you think about it on meetings where we go out of order from what the traditional order of business is, we do that with a two thirds vote because in essence we are uh, uh, we are you know, suspending the normal rules of procedure. So you could take this up at any meeting and you can change it at any meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to correct uh, one thing on that. This was actually asked for in June, on June 9th for Brenda. It was one of her petitions and it slipped through um, the list of items that I have running of uh, petitions. So. Um, this one here is, uh, I think the language that Mike sent over is, is pretty, is pretty good, but, um, Brenda, I see your hand is up. Yes. Um, after reflection, I realized we may want to consider to say the elector, the elector shall use a, the elector or their interpreter shall use a microphone because when we are in person, we may want the information to go over the video for people to be able to hear. Um, it will be inclusive of those with hearing issues, right? Um, it, it will help those who have a hearing impairment be able to, to hear what's being said. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely with getting rid of the stand, but we may want to say something about asking the elector to use the microphone, the elector or their interpreter to use the microphone. 
All right, so what we would be doing is then when recognized by the chairperson, the elector shall um, yeah. utilize the, the microphone, elector or their interpreter would utilize the microphone to give his or her name or address. That would be the suggested change that you're saying? Yes. And there's something further down in that, but we'll do one at a time. Electors may speak for. Is there something in that same paragraph or? Uh, yes, actually, there's um, inconsistency with what we put on the agenda and what's listed further in the paragraph. Um, it says that the agenda says three minutes on any item. But in this procedure, it says three minutes on any action or discussion item on the agenda. Let's see, Stan, here is two minutes on your agenda item five, any topic in the jurisdiction, which is three minutes under, on any actions or discussions. Okay, that's, yeah, one says, uh, so one is under anything under the jurisdiction. Right, and we've been, I believe we have been following what's on the agenda rather than what's in our rules and procedures. So I'd like to, um, make a motion that we follow what's been in the agenda because we've been doing that for a year and a half. Yeah, they're both within the jurisdiction on, uh, now I gotta go back down there. Well, one of them, it says. No, I mean on our agenda, both on our agenda, it says, yeah. uh, you know, any subject within the jurisdiction of the town council, two minutes, and then any subject in the jurisdiction of the town council, three minutes. No, I gotta right. back but there. in that paragraph, it says. Yes. It says also speak for up to three minutes under agenda item 15 on any action or discussion item on the agenda. Right. So it's limiting it to the agenda rather than jurisdiction for the town council. Okay, so I'm amending this as we go. Uh, Steve, I hope you're taking notes um, uh, to, well, do we have to, we haven't made a motion yet. So we're still in discussion of. Yeah of the items. So, so far, if everybody is in agreement, we're saying the elector or their interpreter shall use a microphone, microphone and give his or her name uh, or ad an address. And then changing the, um, the after agenda number 15 from any action or discussion item on the agenda to any topic within the jurisdiction of the town council. Correct. All right. I just had a quick question, if I may. Um, so if, if we're saying the elector or their interpreter shall use a microphone, which name and address would the interpreter be giving, their own or the person they're interpreting for? The and the interpreter is the voice of the elector, so they okay. would be just saying exactly what the elector tells them to. Okay, so the interpreter will be used, would be giving the elector's yeah. name and address. Yeah. Right. Um, Steve, did we confuse you enough? <laughs> no, no, I, I just appreciated the clarification. I think that was the only question I was going to ask in regards to the topic is um, ensuring that, yeah, it, in terms of the not standing, but I want to make sure that approaching the microphone or that approaching any um, piece of technology that can record it for public record as well as for CBC, that it wouldn't cause, our changes wouldn't cause any um, issues or technical difficulties for CBC and our recording, recording clerks. Could I just propose then, instead of the phrase his or her, can we say and give the elector's name and address? Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, I think that's better. Yeah, because his or her is not inclusive of our entire populace. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else have any amendments to the proclamation? All right, Steve. All right, so I would entertain a motion to um, adopt the amended chain changes for item 8.4 as discussed in regards to um, re being recognized by the chairperson, the elector shall give their name and the elector or their interpreter shall give their name and address, as well as any other changes that were discussed reg regarding the uh, rules and procedures. Brenda Fusial, second. Any discussion? All right, uh, Elle is in favor. Brenda? Aye. Cassandra? Aye. Steve? Aye. Don? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. I am an aye, so that passes unanimously. Thank you all very much. It gets us to 8.5 appointments to vacancies on various municipal boards and commissions. I don't think we had any this meeting. 
I don't think we have any either. Um, if, it, if it's okay, uh, Tammy, sorry to interject, if I could just make a quick, just point of order or point of note for sure. that section, mm -hmm. is that Councilor Luba and myself are in the interview process, as well as um, we've corresponded with the chair and vice chair of the Board of Education to clarify our presentation for the both, both of the elected boards. So we're just going through that process for anyone here that's curious about an update. Um, I think it's our hope that in February, we'll be able to bring a full slate to the council to approve. And, and Councilor Luba can clarify if anything's incorrect that I said. No, I, I thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, 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 Councilman Jones. That uh, I, I fully concur that uh, that we are um, that that we are very near the end of the process, and I think that by the uh, next uh, official meeting in February, that we should be able to have hopefully recommendations uh, for the council to consider. Thank you. Thank you both. I know you guys are putting a lot of hard work into this. Um, I appreciate that. And I appreciate everybody who um, came forward to be on the task force. I cannot wait to find out what we've got. Um, that gets us to nine, 9.1. Uh, continued discussion regarding a settlement offer from the Honeywell Corporation. And I see Dr. Willett is here. I'm sorry to keep you so long, Dr. Willett. Uh, nice to see you though in, in a, a bright yellow sweatshirt there. I love yellow, can't wear it, but I love it. So, you know, welcome. Um, Mike, do you want to kick this one off? Sure. Um, so yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Willett, for being here as well. Um, I, uh, I I just wanted to offer as an update to this. I, again, I'm not sure that we're going to be ready to necessarily vote on this tonight. Although, um, if you believe you're satisfied, that that can happen if you're ready. But um, there's been a few updates to the Honeywell um, uh, settlement discussion since our last discussion two weeks ago. Uh, at that time, there were still a few outstanding outstanding things that council wanted us to keep um, tracking and, and trying to get to the bottom of. So there was the discussion about whether the town attorneys drafted language uh, exempting um, subcontractors uh, and uh, people that did installation or any, any warranties that are still in play this many years into the Honeywell um, uh, it's agreement that we have with them, uh, that would, they were exempted from that so that they would still be held accountable for any uh, issues or wrong um, machine parts that are, you know, potentially wear out too soon or whatever it might be. And the news on that is that um, Honeywell has responded to Lisa's email about it, and that included Rick's drafted language. And they did actually um, respond with indication of the affirmative, but they wanted to amend a little bit on the language. So um, at this point, they have written back their own version of what Rick had drafted, uh, which Rick has reviewed and actually would like to discuss with the Board of Education's attorney, which I believe that meeting is happening tomorrow, thanks to Walt helping me coordinate that. Um, so they do want to talk a little bit further on it, but it sounds like we're moving in the right direction with regards to uh, what the initial um, Board of Education member, um, Sophia, had uh, suggested back in when we had that joint meeting. Um, so that, that's one bit of good news. The other thing is that um, both the town's uh, bond attorney looked over the agreement and the Board of Education's lawyer, and I don't want to speak for Walt, and, 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 but I believe they looked it over as well, and that both of those attorneys do believe that the Honeywell settlement, um, it looks appropriate, uh, probably that it's a good deal, or at least that we should consider accepting it, but they don't want to put words in council's mouth. So, um, but we did, we went through three different lawyers now that have all looked it over, and uh, we're feeling more and more comfortable and confident that this is something that we want to do. But um, I just wanted, to, I'll leave it at that. I don't know if Dr. Willett or Lisa, if you have anything to add on tonight's update. Hi, Lisa. Hi, sorry about that. Um, the only other thing to add is that um, there was a question regarding the lease and if this settlement would have any impact on the actual lease that we have with TD Bank and the bond attorney, as well as I think the board attorney looked at it as well, but the bond attorney said that there would be no issue with the lease and this contract settlement. So there'd be no issue there. Um, that's about all I have to add to this. Thank you, Lisa. I appreciate um, all the work everybody's doing on this to make sure that we've got the town fully covered. Um, Lou. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I, I would I would uh, echo your sentiments. I think that this is something that's awesome. I've had a chance to take a look at 
what we've had so far. And I think uh, Lisa and her group have really done an outstanding job, not only to uh, get this agreement together, but now we're also getting some additional, what looks like possible additional funds out of them. Um, so that's, I think that's outstanding. I'd also uh, like to thank the Board of Education uh, for their review of it and uh, reaching across the lines. And I see Sophia's on here. Uh, I'd like to thank her for her, uh, for her uh, work on this, where she, uh, that she was one of the people that recognized one of these issues that, uh, that I missed. Uh, and I will accept that. And I want to thank her for finding that because that is something that would have uh, been a significant issue had we gone forward on it. So uh, I just want to thank everyone for their hard work. Thank you. Yeah, I just uh, noticed Sophia was on too. So Sophia, um, I know you're muted right now, but thank you again also for, for finding that and in, in giving us the opportunity <laughs> See? <laughs> to make sure we got it covered. I appreciate it. <laughs> Two lawyers are better than one in this case. I, I think we're up to like five lawyers now. So, you know, I, I think we're kind of lawyer, we, we've hit our lawyer max on this. So, <laughs> um, Steve? No, no, I just wanted to echo Councillor Luba's remarks and just give thanks to all of our volunteers as well as our paid staff that went over this and it sounds like we'll be able to move forward in a very um, positive way towards a settlement. I was just curious if at this if at this point, I don't know if anyone else has any comments, but are we planning to table this discussion for a future meeting until we hear back from the conversations between our town attorney and the superintendent's attorney or the Board of Education's attorney? I think that's the intent, right, Mike? They're meeting tomorrow and we'll get it back on uh, probably the next agenda. We'll, we'll have it all wrapped up to be able to discuss and finalize uh, for our uh, first meeting in January. February. February. Yeah, I, I think that would be ideal uh, in the sense that I, I think that conversation should take place prior to us taking action, uh, just, just so that we're not missing anything. As you said, multiple lawyers are better than one to get together and talk about language and stuff. Because again, they they proposed the counter wording on the Honeywell side. So we wanna make sure we're not missing anything there. But uh, so that is happening tomorrow. And um, we have also, I forgot to mention this earlier, but we did also reach out when we, when we spoke about um, the town attorney's drafted language. We also asked for uh, continued patience on Honeywell's end because this has kind of been outstanding now for quite a few months. And, um, you know, they understand that it's a public process and that these meetings happen every two weeks, et cetera. So it does take time. Um, so I just, you know, we don't want to run out the clock with them, obviously, here. I think, you know, maybe another meeting is all it's going to take. So if we can come back confident at the next meeting in February that, um, that everything's been looked over to, you know, ad nauseum, then we will let you know that. So. Okay. Uh, anything else, uh, Steve? Um, I was just going to say, if, if, if that concludes our conversation, I was just going to entertain a motion to, or I was going to make a motion to table item 9.1 to a future agenda item uh, pending conversations between town attorneys uh, with the Board of Education, as well as clarifying any language provided by Honeywell. Lulu, I'll we'll second that motion. Any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, Brenda? Aye. Cassandra? Aye. Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. Nice, that passes unanimously. We will table it. Gets us to 10, report of the town manager. Hi, uh, good evening, Mike Rosen, town manager. Um, I just have a couple of things tonight, not not too many. So uh, some we touched on already, but um, my myself, Lisa, and, and Mike Wilkinson, we've been in budget meetings with all of the departments where we've got one more day to go tomorrow to go through all of the department budgets, and we're going to compile everything and see where we stand at that point. And, uh, you know, what, and I got to say, having almost been through, you know, this is my second time now, and the, I, the department heads are doing an awesome job. And I, and I did read the Board of Ed's budget as well, but I, you know that's uh, that's not really on my desk yet at the moment. So, but I just want to say the department heads are doing an awesome job in the sense that they're listening to what we have, we've been asking to put forward reasonable requests. Uh, there, a lot of them in many cases are voluntarily taking small, very small, modest increases or even taking decreases. Uh, they're they're pointing out where there's efficiencies, where there's things that haven't been done for years and why are we still doing this? And so they're doing a great, they listen to council's direction, they listen to the manager's direction. So I want to acknowledge that, that, you know, I appreciate 
when you get a reasonable budget that's that's not you know unnecessarily inflated, which also makes it harder to cut from. Obviously, if we need to, if maybe we don't, if it's truly if it's truly what the departments need, that is what I will propose to town council when the time is right for that. So um, you know we're we're still going through the process, and uh, but that's taking up a lot of time right now. And the capital budget um, public hearing is February 11th. Uh, at this point, with everything, it's most likely going to be on Zoom, um, not in person. So uh, we will get the login credentials for that when the time is right. But uh, we that's the meeting where we go through the, co the capital budget uh, line item by line item. And the department heads are all present to answer any questions from either the public or the council on next year's um, or any of the five years of the capital budget. But most for the most part, it's mostly the next year or two that are the most clear, the picture is the most clear for. Um, so I was also well, speaking of capital budget because the firehouse improvement plan is, uh, the project is on the budget for this capital cycle. Uh, I just wanted to mention that in case anybody didn't notice, there is a section of the town website that is now dedicated to, um, to this project specifically because it's such a large project in both the sense that it's a community need and also in the dollar amount at $5 million. We thought that it best to, to create a landing page for it uh, so that we can start to post information on there that people can look over. Right now the on that landing page, which is on the town's website, the front page, if you scroll down on the left-hand side, it says Firehouse Capital Improvement Project. Uh, you'll see the presentation that we gave to the town council a few weeks ago. Um, and I'm working with John Lytell on updating it further prior to our uh, prior to our next meeting um, or prior to our the capital budget meeting. I'm sorry, and uh, and that way there's more information on there. Uh, and I know we're also having a meeting this week with the um, Morton Building folks to talk more about um, design and uh, what what these what this might really look like, so that we can put that on the website as a schematic, so people can understand what we're talking about for the two for the two firehouses that are um, being recommended to be uh, 340 and 440 to be knocked down and be re replaced with Morton buildings. We want to show what that's going to look like so that people aren't you know unsure conceptually. Um, we are also on the interviewing front. Uh, we are in final stages with planning director again. Uh, hopefully this one pans out better than the last time around. And we are also beginning interviews with um, the town manager's executive assistant position, which uh, that's Kim Kowalshin had gone over to the senior center to be the director. So we're trying to refill her shoes, which is going to be hard to do. Um, but that those interviews are occurring uh, next week as well. So we're very busy and, uh, you know, we thank you for your patience and we try to get back to you in a timely manner. So um, that's all I have for manager's report. Thank you. Okay, that gets us to 11. Oh, I think Steve had his hand up, by the way. I don't oh, know. Did he? I'm sorry, Steve. Sorry. No worries. Actually, th thank you, Town Manager Rosen. You actually did effectively answer most of my questions. I was going to ask for an update on the town planner and executive assistant interview process or where we were. The only question actually I do have regarding the fires capital improvement project. I know that we're limiting people's time within town hall, but is there a physical copy available in either the library or one of the town offices. I know we normally do that for, um, I think our POCD as well as our budget, we usually put a physical copy out there for um, public dissemination for those without internet access. Um, that's a good idea. So what right now, what we would put in that book would just right now, all we have is the uh, facilities history that was presented. Um, if you'd like, I can try to do it all together so that prior to the public hearing, uh, which this will be a part of the public hearing this project. I'll try to put everything together into a public hearing binder, which we can put in the library. We'll put all the materials, including the firehouse materials, into that binder so that the library patrons can view it. No, I'll make great. a note of that. I'll make a note of that. Okay, thank you. And that, that covers it for me. Otherwise, you know, keep up the good work. I think it's been definitely a very challenging environment to, to hire. And obviously the first round was a little bit difficult, but it sounds like there's... Uh, some good opportunities to move forward this year. Okay, that gets us to uh, 11, adoption of minutes. All right, Steve Jones, I would make a motion to adopt the minutes as laid out in 11.1, 11.2, and also 11.2 for both special and regular meeting minutes. Uh, 
Any discussion? All those in favor, uh, Brenda? Aye. Cassandra? Aye. Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Uh, Luke? Aye. Kurt? Aye. And I have an aye, so those passed unanimously. That gets to 12. Um, correspondence to council. All right, this is Brenda Felucci. Hold on, let me grab a drink of water. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just gonna make a note before Brenda speaks if it's all right. Um, I, I believe our last meeting you had to depart early, so we actually didn't do any correspondence from the prior I know, meeting. I have I don't it all. Go back that far, but <laughs> just, I, just I, as a point. I do have it all. So okay, great. Um, Thank you. I just continued on my list. All right. So, um, so this is one month's worth of correspondence. We received an um, email in favor of declaring racism as a public health um, emergency. It just the email describes how conversations at the dinner table are different for Black families. One, one resident shared their perspective on racism and. Um, wasn't asking for us to go either way, just wanted to share their feelings. Um, we had another resident who feels that we have snobbishness in Tolland, not racism. Another said we must address racism wherever it exists, but not do the declaration. Um, another asked, and again, these are going back for a month. So another asked Tammy to step down um, as the chair. Another agrees a racism is horrible behavior, but no need for an emergency declaration. Another wrote in for support of um, Tammy staying on the council. Um, a business owner resident who uh, wrote in letting us know that they've never seen racism in Tallinn um, does not support Tammy uh, stepping down and claims that I am creating division in the town. Another supporting, uh, another who supports declar the declaration um, and believes that um, we can have a decent and respectful town. Another says that just do not make the vaccine mandatory and calls vaccines, um, this vaccine experimental and risky. Um, another requesting the resolution similar to the one in, in Mansfield, renouncing the assist, um, that was for the January 6th, um, renouncing the incident and um, Another that says, does not believe Tolland is deeply racist, agrees there are inequities and with historical and economic issues, but not blatant hate. Another supports for, um, uh, sent in an email in support of reverse osmosis filters at the schools. Uh, an email expressing disappointment with board of M members not wearing masks during an in-person meeting. Another asking us to focus on why we were elected. It don't speak for, we don't speak for the entire town. So there's no justification for any of the declarations. Uh, another saying, while the actions in Washington and racism are items we don't agree with, we shouldn't be assuming the, the resident's thoughts. Another resident and small business owner um, says the two proclamations are controversial issues. And we ask, ask that we do not speak for the entire town. Um, another in support of both proclamations, it says it shows Tallinn is answering the call for unity and it identifies the issues facing us and works towards solutions. One student shared a story um, about the many acts of racism that they have witnessed in the town. Um, another email again from a student about um, racism being real. A resident stating it is wasteful and counterproductive to declare racism a public health emergency. Um, another who agrees that racism is bad but doesn't see racism here and feels this is frivolous. Another email, uh, the resident feels this is uncalled for and people should um, just respect one another. Another says they do not condone the riot in DC and does not want council to speak for us. Um, there's no need to act on the racism and we should focus on building community. Another who says the topics are too controversial and is not in support of either proclamation. A resident who shares his wife's immigration story, um, which we heard um, earlier, um, feels that people are weaponizing the word racism 
um, and it's not a real issue. Uh, another who wants to see the proclamations before voting because they were not listed in the packet. Um, another says it's important to recognize racism, particularly in Connecticut, where we are divided um, by income inequality and uh, unequal access. Another that supports the proclamation, um, not doing so in its in itself an act of racism. Another that says we should support the racism declaration. It sends a clear message of our values. Another that says support lists um, the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Physicians, the American Public Health Association, and more um, in that state that racism is a public health emergency and our town should be up standards. Last page. Um, a resident who supports both proclamations Oh, who, I'm sorry, a resident who says both proclamations are a partisan ploy. A resident wrote in saying they support the declaration of racism. It shows Talon's commitment to be an inclusive community. Another says that, um, that their daughter has been called racial slurs to her face. Another who says pleased, they're pleased to hear we are considering the proclamations um, we prosper as a community when we work through partnerships. Another resident says there's no drafts to see, but um, they do, they are not in support. It seems like virtue signaling and they want us to focus on the list of goals instead. Um, a resident wrote in for support of the proclamations. They show we support equality for all. Another resident said they support both proclamations. A resident and business owner says that we do not um, have, they have not run into racism in our town and there's no need for the proclamations. An email in support of the proclamation. Um, another email asking us to be uncomfortable and committed to making positive changes. Another email that had testimony about their child being called racial slurs and um, how that impacts the entire person. A resident writing in concerning advanced CT offering and had some other options, which we discussed. Um, just a couple more. Um, a resident wrote in with support with wide range of examples in, in supporting information for declaring racism as a public health emergency. Another that says they condemn the attack on the Capitol and they want to make Tal an example by helping people with kindness. Uh, another resident wrote in that they support both measures. Inequities are present um, and we had a petition with 393 signatures for more racial inclusivity, inclusivity in our schools. And that was everything I had as of 645 this evening. That was a lot. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, okay, that gets to 13 chairperson's report. So um, I am going to ask all of the town council members to please remember to go and review your capital plan for our meeting in February. Um, we're not having a meeting before the public hearing. So any questions that you have will be asked of the staff at the public hearing. But in order to make it a more efficient process, if you have questions at a high level, um, not necessarily super detailed stuff right now, but high level questions, can you please send them over to Mike so he can let the staff know so they can be prepared for the, um, the questions that we may ask. Um, all of that will be gone over in the public hearing, but giving them a heads up so, so they're not kind of taken off by what we're gonna ask them, I think would be useful. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, to reiterate that um, I think it's important that we continue to have conversations and look for opportunities to bring programming to the town on, on our side of the, um, on our side of what we control, you know, the town council with the town services and the library and stuff like that, that we continue to try to bring some program into the town to learn and participate in meaningful conversations. Um, and I think when we, have the conversation at the next meeting. It's important that we reavow what we stand for here in Tolland as elected officials and what we can do to make our town more inclusive and positive. I just wanted to also bring up 
as I said, uh, I think a lot of the issues that we see that come with this declaration of racism are things that are a state level process um, issue that uh, we can't fix these problems um, at a town level because they're not things that the town provides or does, but we can work on them at a state level and we are working them at a state level. There's a lot of bills that are being proposed right now. I myself have put in legislation for um, many of the issues that we've discussed in town here, including um, Mike, just so you know, a bonding ask for the fire stations. Um, I've got legislation in including mental health availability and affordability, um, contaminated wells, um, upticks in crime, parented, I'm co-signing a parentage bill for the LGBTQ community. Uh, we're looking, I'm asking to look at next dollar cliff limits that impact affordable housing and senior housing, um, expansion of telehealth, um, most importantly in the mental health arena, trying to find ways to bring mental health providers to the table to deepen our network of mental health providers. Um, I've asked for a review of the ECS formula and the impact that it has on rural towns. Um, if anybody looked at the ECS report that came out, Tolland, Tolland is losing the most amount of money in the state every year. Literally, we are losing the most amount of money. Um, and that comes by way of the second half of the ECS formula. Um, so I'm asking for a formal review on what the impact of that formula is to rural towns. The majority of the towns that are losing money are rural towns. I've also asked for relief for towns that are affected uh, with crumbling foundations from the ECS loss. I've asked for um, a propane tax uh, that to be removed for medically nece medical ne necessity generators. Um, I've also asked for giving the Board of Ed more autonomy on mandates, um, a bill asking for a grant program for generators with people with medical um, necessity issues. And um, one of my bigger pieces I'm actually kind of happy to announce, I'm getting a public hearing on a new program that I am asking for that is aimed at keeping college graduates in the state to help pay off their student loan and um, give a five-year contractual agreement with them to work for the state. Um, that is a non-union position. Um, it's actually gonna be raised up for public hearing and it coincides with the capital workforce uh, program plan that's going on right now, which we had a big meeting on today to talk about different initiatives to try to bring um, manufacturing training and other skills training back to our schools and programs for underserved communities, uh, programs for people who have lost their job through COVID, which are tend to be our lower wage earners and um, looking for ways to kind of keep college grads here and give people back the, the dream of actually attaining a middle-class job without a college education. So there's a lot of things that are going on at the state that are going to be addressing a lot of these issues. Um, and I think that there's a lot of good movement happening and I encourage people to stay involved um, and be aware of what's happening and contact people. So that's it for me. Um, and that gets us to 14 communications and petitions from council persons. <clears throat> Does anybody, uh, John? have anything. Madam, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I'd like to revisit the proclamations because there was procedural discussion, but there was no real discussion on the substance of what these proclamations meant. So I'll take them one at a time, starting with racism as a public health emergency. We've had a fair amount of communication on this issue from people both supporting the proclamation and people opposing it. But some things really stick out in my mind. Back at the town council meeting on December 22nd, and as recently as today on email, we were told that if this town council fails to declare racism as a public health emergency, that in itself would be a racist act. We were also told that if we failed to declare racism as a healthcare emergency, we were immature racist white supremacists. And tonight we've also heard some passionate personal experiences from some of our residents. So rather than a proclamation or a resolution, I support a back and forth exchange of thoughts, ideas, and opinions using reason, logic, and facts without finger pointing, inflammatory language, and unfounded accusations, simply because some of us look at an issue through a different lens. But with this idea of racism as a public health emergency here in Tolland lies in the fact that 
I'm having trouble associating substandard healthcare with race in our town that justifies declaring an emergency. Because if any resident in Tallinn is receiving substandard healthcare as a result of their race, then that is something we as a community should talk about and try to find a way to fix. But out of all the communication we've received on this issue, I haven't heard of a single thing that justifies an emergency declaration, particularly concerning healthcare. In order for me to support a declaration of an emergency, I need to be able to answer the question, why? And I can't answer that when it comes to race and healthcare in Tallinn, even after reading every email that's come in up until this afternoon and listening to public comment at these meetings, I'm not seeing a reason to declare a public health emergency in Tallinn, and I can't justify declaring an emergency simply because a handful of people are asking for it. And while I certainly, certainly acknowledge that racism exists in our community, a blanket declaration is not going to change the conversations around the dinner tables in Tallinn. I've heard of some racist incidents that have occurred in town, but the only way to effectively deal with these types of incidences is through education. Because racism, as we heard earlier tonight, exists in the human heart and in the human mind, not in any system. And the only way to address these types of human failings is through education. Now, as a town council, our focus should be on Tallinn only, what the issues are in Tallinn. And I haven't yet heard of anything that justifies an emergency declaration. But if racist incidents, like the ones we heard tonight, are persisting here in town, and I don't know if they are or if they're not, it may make sense to look for educational opportunities that may be available. Because the one thing that education will do that an emergency declaration won't do is maybe give an opportunity for someone to pick up some information they didn't have before, which may lead to a neighbor talking to a neighbor or a parent talking to a child. So I see that as a worthy effort. Now, as far as the uh, events of January 6th at Capitol, uh, it's important to understand our role as a town council. We're here to conduct the business of Tolland, that's it. We were all elected solely by residents of Tolland and that's where our focus needs to be. We're not here to make statements or proclamations or anything else about national events because who picks which events we're supposed to address? There are events that take place every day in our country that someone may want this council to make a statement on. So where does the line get drawn? Well, for me, the line gets drawn at the Tolland town border. Anything beyond the borders of Tolland is beyond the scope of what we do or what we should be doing as a town council. And we have no business reaching into and addressing or otherwise commentating on national events. So I do not support any activities along those lines. Madam Chair, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Lou. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, there's a uh three issues or three things I'd like to address. First is a uh, petition that I will be filing in proper uh, proper order with the uh, with the town council with uh, with you, Madam Chair, which is uh, to uh, review the uh, the provisions dealing with the Veterans Recognition Commi uh, Commission, where I think that it needs to be updated because of the addition of Space Force that we need, that we should make it more inclusive to include uh, members of all armed forces and I would also like to examine the uh, possibility of expanding expanding the membership to include the immediate family members of any members of anyone that would meet the requirements uh, as a uh, veteran with uh, as defined by the appropriate town code provisions. That um, that right now that that is the only uh, only committee where it is restricted in any way uh, beyond just being a uh, voting town uh, town resident that uh, and so as such I like to expand that and and examine that issue but I will file the appropriate request with uh, with you madam chair uh, and uh, for the uh, town council to consider uh, secondly I'd like to address the uh, the uh, the issue that I brought up with my objection to the uh, declaration that were previously or the proclamation requests were previously presented my objections were not based upon my disbelief of any of those issues. I, I do not want it to be construed that I do not believe that racism exists or that I'm against anything regarding uh, addressing the issue of racism within the town of Tallinn. That is not what my purpose is. That my purpose was to, uh, for that objection was to address the issue that that is a proclamation, is not the proper form. And to use a proclamation to circumvent the proper process to be followed 
and, and short circuit it to fast track an issue or political issue or a, uh, or the other other issue through the use of a proclamation and thus forcing it to be put on the uh, the agenda within a period of two weeks is inappropriate. And that's what my objection is too. that with regard to the declaration. I also want to stress the fact that any declaration of a public health emergency, although that many people are saying that this would be a good thing for the town to do, or this is something that will show our solidarity, that this is another time to, to paraphrase uh, our president, words have meaning. And that this is something where by declaring a public health emergency, the words aren't just symbolic words, that that is something that carries with it legal requirements and legal authorities. And as such, that that is something that, that we really need to examine because by declaring a public health emergency, that then creates other legal obligations such as funding and such as the time period, such as who is the one that decides when the, when the, uh, when the emergency is over. That if a public health emergency is set for a specific, up to the point where we've come into the COVID issue was for a set time period, that it was until the crisis is over. This is something that the uh, country has been dealing with for well over 200 years and is not something that's going to be going away. So this is not something to, uh, that, that would be that we could solve through a public health emergency declaration. Um, the last thing is I'd like to, uh, like to echo what, uh, what's been said to this point, but also read a statement as well. Um, so over the recent weeks, the town council has been asked by a small handful of residents to take official actions on issues of declaring racism a public health emergency, as well as the issuance of an official statement condemning the abhorrent acts of insurrection that occurred at the Capitol building. We received correspondence and comments from residents, including BIPOC residents, both supporting and opposing such official acts. The town council as a whole will choose the most appropriate way in how to address these matters as an elected body representing the concerns of all town residents. As a council member, I was prepared to issue my own personal statement regarding these issues. But upon further reflection, I decided against it. For what my personal feelings are regarding a political or social issue is immaterial. As a town council, it is our obligation to focus on the best interests of our town and our residents. Foster open and honest discussion on town issues. Develop reasonable town budgets. Implement logical town policies and pass sound town legislation. Not use our position as a bully pul bully pulpit to espouse political or social platitudes or present the town as a tally for a national or politi national political or social movement on either side of the spectrum while ignoring the pressing needs of our own town residents. While certain other towns and other elected representatives may feel this is appropriate, I do not. At this point, I would like to address another disturbing trend that appears to be taking hold within the town of Tallinn that only serves to sow division and stifle the free and open exchange of ideas, which is integral to combating the, and overcoming the multitude of serious issues facing our town and our community. This is the growing cancel culture movement, which has been appearing across the spectrum of discussion throughout town. This movement has taken hold in social media, personal and business interactions, and as we have seen today, has even infiltrated open exchange of ideas within town council hearings. These actions encompass what I will call the colloquialization of pejoratives, which includes the increasingly casual usage of allegations of racism, homophobia, bigotry, supremacy, and most recently, complicity, complicity in treason and insurrection. Statement, statements such as, if you don't agree with me, or if you don't, do the speaker's desired action, you are a insert pejorative term here, have been cre increasingly used as part of our public discussion and correspondence to council as well as other town boards and committees. The sole purpose of this is to weaponize these indicting and condemning terms, using them as a cudgel aimed to either bludgeon others into silence or force them to acquiesce to the speaker's demands. This new McCarthyism is done as a form of censorship aimed to cancel any contrary views and end open and meaningful discussion on serious issues, forcing people to either blindly accept the speaker's position out of fear of being labeled in such a way. For once you are painted with such a label, it is a stain that is nearly impossible to remove. It is meant to dissuade honest disagreement and meaningful discourse, which is at the core of solving the most important problems facing our town, our state, and our nation. 
Moreover, the repeated and casual utterances of such allegations only minimizes the serious problems of racism, bigotry, and unification of our country, and leads to diminished marginal utility of these terms, and that calling everything you disagree with racist, bigoted, or treasonous only serves to desensitize and diminish the seriousness of truly condemnable actions. Our council, along with all of our elected boards, our state legislature, and our Congress were all founded on the principles of free and open dialogue, first and foremost. We can agree to disagree, but we all need to be able to speak and listen to one another instead of destructive act of speaking at one another and immediately, immediately reacting to label somebody and invoke cancel culture. It is only through that process of an open, respectful discussion, not cancellation and name calling, that we can come together to tackle serious issues facing our town and our nation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, thank you, Lou. Um, if you can send me the petition about the veterans uh, recognition thing, I will, I will take a look at that. Yes, I will. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Steve. Yeah, Steve Jones. So just a couple of things. One item was um, just sort of as a point of information, the library through um, I believe the director or I believe other staff, if you're looking to request books and information, um, you know, in terms of segregation or racism or, or systemic issues such as that could be requested. And I think is another way to make information dialogue and open discussion as well as providing information to the residents um, is openly accessible. I believe that's a process that you just reach out to the library and say, if you feel like a book would be worthwhile for the library to carry, they can go through the process of acquiring that. Um, I did want to request, and this doesn't need to necessarily be brought up in a future meeting, but I was curious how our revised cemetery policy has been working or not working for public works. I believe our meeting was about one year ago that we did our site walk as a council, um, minus, uh, I think, uh, Cassandra was not a counselor at that time. I think um, Bob was still a counselor at that time. So just curious if Scott is, is still finding that policy and working very well. And just as a final note, I know it's sort of a long-term thought process in terms of one of the goals that we listed in terms of a civic engagement um, task force. But I feel like a lot of the discussion tonight is sort of an area where this touches upon, both in terms of how we engage with one another, as well as the accessibility of engaging with one another. Um, I feel like there has been an increased public participation on multiple boards and commissions through Zoom. And even in a post-COVID environment, I think that's one area that I think we as a community should be tasked with is um, continuing uh, public engagement and civic participation, not only in public meetings, but also finding avenues to engage residents in public elections, both municipal bonding referendums, budget referendums, and municipal elections. So I think, I think just a lot of this discussion and engagement kind of highlights why that's an important issue to me and to the community. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and Mike, if, if uh, we could kind of take that away to just kind of get a, a check in with um, what public works um, might have in regards to the, the cemetery policy, how it's, mm -hmm. how it's going. Right. Sounds good. Yep, just let me know. Um, Brenda. Sorry, my picture moved on me as I was going for the unmute button, it jumped. Um, so, I want, I want to say that Talland um, is part of a wider community and what we do in our town does impact the rest of the state. I already um, mentioned one example about doing that when we were talking about equity, which is our solid waste. Our solid waste gets taken out of our town and sent to a, um, another community and um, the air pollution in that community um, is, a, is a direct result of what we do here in Talland. So finding ways to decrease our solid waste um, helps other communities. So, um, you know, I respectfully disagree that we draw the line at our town. I think the policies that we do in town um, can be looked at so that we are ensuring that there is equity, um, that we are not participating in systemic racism. Um, going back to sustainable CT, um, one of the very low hanging fruit that we can do is develop and adopt a statement on equity. 
um, if we want to be participating in the matching program um, and using those resources for our town, we should be participating in the other parts of the program. And I think that this um, 1.3 develop and adopt a statement on equity is something that is low hanging fruit and we should do right away. I'd also like to revisit that we have since last town council, we have been um, supposed to be looking at uh, appointing a poet laureate for the town um, and or artist for the town. And again, that's something that's very low hanging fruit that we can work with some other boards and commissions and in increase the cultural um, aspects of our community. Um, and, you know, lastly, I was going to um, read a, a statement if we were going to have a discussion. Um, I'm, I'm going to jump around on it a bit, take it, take a lot of it out. I, we all know that Talon's a proud, generous and giving community. We've witnessed with our volunteers at every tragic event or emergency we have, our neighbors band together and we support each other community, community members. When we hear that a family is suffering, we ask, what do you need? And we provide, whether it's just um, our community members or it's an organization uh, through organizations in town. We have listened to our neighbors who need assistance with things like crumbling foundations, contaminated wells, residents with disabilities, we're taking a look at um, mental health and even more. When our neighbors ask, we answer. Um, this racism issue is no different. Our, our residents have shown that they are um, victims of racism. Um, I have a lot of people who came to me because they did not feel comfortable sending an email to the entire town council. They didn't want their name um, to be out there. They've shared with me that their black and brown children are in our schools and in our sports programs are called dehumanizing names with little or no, no meaningful correction or education from their parents, their staffs, or their coaches. That our black neighbors are more likely to have lower um, weight infants at birth, um, that their infants are more likely, more likely to um, die during their first year of life. That they are not offered appropriate pain meds. They have a higher instance of diabetes and high blood pressure. They die more prevalently from certain cancers. They're not offered or they avoid curative measures and more. Um, the, I'll share one more story that was shared with me. A family, a, a mom was gonna ask her son to stop and pick up an item from one of those free sites. You know how they leave it right by the door so she texted her son and said, can you go pick this up for me? And he was coming from basketball and he says, no, mom, I can't. She's, he's like, not unless you're going to call them and tell them that a, your black son, a black young man is gonna to come to that house and pick up something. I don't know them. I've seen on um, social media and other places that people say, I don't fit in. And if they see people that aren't from the neighborhood um, that they will respond first and ask questions later. So we, our neighbors are facing this issue and we need to make some, um, we need to make some inroads. We need to make some changes. We need to address this. Um, if people aren't willing to make a de declaration, I'm willing to find other ways to make, um, to make some changes a committee on equity and inclusion. I've asked for this before. I already have at least 15 people who are willing to volunteer on this. We can participate in equity training. Um, again, that's with sustainable CT. We can make goals. Um, we can do the adopt a statement on equity and we could do even more. Um, for me, each oath I make, each proclamation we do, each policy that we do, um, I try to make sure that I follow through and that it's not just um, words on a piece of paper, that we're actually doing actionable items. So I'm ready to be working, to work with being an inclusive town, um, a town that works for equity. We should not wait one more day. We should not wait two more weeks. Um, I'm sure that most of you know that even before we got on Zoom that I was going to support this. Um, and even though I feel that we should be doing a declaration on public health emergency, I'm 
hoping that we can find some sort of consensus and find a way to address what our neighbors need because they've told us there's a need. Um, they've told us that they are suffering and it's we should not be ignoring it. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Um, Cassandra. Look around. Okay. Um, so uh, I had a large, long personal statement written, and I do agree with Lou that we are a town council and we shouldn't be representing our own personal thoughts per se. We should be representing the town as a whole. I am going to share a little bit of my own personalness and then go on to more global thoughts. But not, I don't know how many people know this, but I grew up in Northern British Columbia, Canada, and my whole neighborhood was of a diverse melting pot of different cultures from black to brown to yellow to white. Everyone was different and we all respected each other's differences. So in Canada, racism isn't usually this word that people bring up, although we do know it exists. And we work very hard in that country to create equity and inclusion for everybody. And uh, since moving here to Connecticut, I think it's probably one of the least diverse places I've ever lived in my life. And I've lived in three different places in Canada, two different provinces. So the fact that we're crying, not crying, and declaring statements about racism is apparent that we need obviously more diverse knowledge and education for everybody. Um, we need to understand each other better um, instead of finger pointing. We need to um, sit together with constructive talks um, that respect each other rather than saying that someone doesn't understand where another person's coming from without having a conversation. Um, one thing I would like to point out is that there are ramifications when we start declaring crises that are related to race. Um, certain races will get um, put at a priority above other races, which can have greater impacts on health. For example, in Canada right now with the COVID vaccine, the Native American population has been prioritized above other populations, including healthcare. And um, that's been something that's been tough in Canada. And for everyone, there should be access to the vaccine. And it makes it a little bit difficult when you know, we're trying to say that race is more important than say age or more is important, more important than say someone's job. Um, we should all be treated equally and equity inclusion is that is looking at everyone equally. If there isn't equality within health measures, there is stuff that is being done to understand that. And in fact, on January 20th, President Biden did sign an executive order that, and I was just going over it again, on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities through the federal government. Our federal government is putting millions and millions of dollars in multiple different agencies right now to help us understand how we can create more racial equity and equality and support for individuals that are not yet receiving it. And this is a great thing that we should all be celebrating talking about instead of fighting amongst ourselves in the town, celebrating the fact that we, are, we have an executive order to help improve what's going on. And that's gonna have a far greater reach than long, long winded arguments on a town council meeting where our words don't mean as much as the actions of our federal government. Our words mean as much to each other and to treat each other respectfully. And I always find it so strange here how people care more about being right than they care about helping each other sometimes and working together. Last year, as a Girl Scout troop leader, I held a whole day event on equity and inclusion. Um, it was more a disability focus, but you know, I work within this community to help people you know, become better and to support each other. And I find it very disheartening that there's little of that today. And I hope we can all work together to understand that we are trying to improve our world, our, our country, our communities, and we, as has been said, it can only be done if we do it with each other and not fight amongst these ourselves. We understand racism is wrong. I don't agree with it. I don't act in racist ways. And I hope that my neighbors don't either. And maybe some neighbors need more education to understand that racism does exist and there are children and adults who are affected by it. And that we are happy now that we have an executive order that is going to allow more 
research done in multiple agencies to provide what is needed for our entire country to be more equitable and to serve underserved communities better. And that's all I have to say about that. Thank you. Um, Kurt. Uh, thank you, uh, Tammy. Um, I'd just like to make a, a quick statement about my support of striking the two proclamations listed on today's agenda. Um, I, I found Councilman Luba's thoughts on the impropriety of these proclamations highly persuading and agreed that this is not the correct way to create town policy. With that said, I feel obligated to reiterate as if my words and actions on this council and throughout my life has not set a clear enough example for where I stand. I would like to, in, in clear and uncertain terms, denounce any and all forms of violence as a means of political end, and I detest all forms of bigotry and strive for fair and equal treatment of all, regardless of race, creed, sexual orientation, or gender. With that said, I look forward to further discuss discussions on these topics as the years continue, and hopefully we can make a real impact in the town. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve, your hands up again. Yeah, sorry, just a second go around. I don't know if this would be a conversation or a potential item of topic for discussion for the council at a future meeting. I wonder if our town green signage policy, I, I'm trying to pull up the information if we had a list of events that we allowed to be provided up there, if there could be any potential alignment for those recognitions to also be um, explicitly listed within our proclamation policy. You know, if there are people that want to put up signage for Black History Month on our town green, you know, would, would that also be germane that if we're endorsing that, we would also endorse um, a proclamation for that request or, you know, similar to the LGBTQ, you know, Pride Month um, signage that I think is either expected or anticipated for this year due to the change in policies, if, if that also reflects in how we establish um, proclamations in the community. So that's just a thought that came to mind throughout all these discussions we've had. So if I remember correctly, our green policy is anything that is a presidential proclamation. Okay. A official presidential proclamation can be recognized, I believe. Is that right, Mike? I'm yeah, I pulled it up. We, we adopted in uh, September 8th, 2020, and it says, uh, requests for a day, week, or month recognition sign must be scheduled with the town manager's office Preference will be given to events over recognition if there are more than five signs on the green. A recognition can be up the day before and be taken down within two days after the recognized day, week, or month. The approved list of recognized events is the presidential proclamation list and is subject to change. So this, our, our in-house policy refers to the presidential proclamation list, which changes with the president. As they make proclamations, right? Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's just where I think my, my mindset was going was whether or not in terms of explicitly stating what's sort of generally considered for proclamation requests, just to make it more clear to the public that if we aligned it with our green policy, if that would be reasonable to everyone to either discuss or if we actually even need to have that be something that be voted upon by the council to, to revise or make explicit on our um, town website. I'll put it down. You're gonna have to send me something on that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to you. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. All right, that gets us to 15, public list of participation on any subject within the jurisdiction of the town council, three minute limit. Same thing applies, if you're on a device, you can raise your hand down under reactions or in the participations, there's an ability to raise your hand. When you are called on, please state your name and address for the record. If you are on a phone, it is star nine, and that will raise your hand. And when you are called on, again, name and address for the record. You have a, a three minute time limit if anybody would like to speak. And also just before anyone does speak, it is a two minute limit. I am trying to provide sort of a 30 second grace period if I feel impl implicitly that the summary is being, or the remarks are being summarized. If not, that's where I interject. Okay. Excuse me, I believe oh, it's three minutes. Oh, three minutes. Three minutes for the second round, yeah. Sorry, three minutes for the second round. Let me update my stopwatch there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I don't see anybody. So 16 on the agenda. 
Sorry, just scrolling back to that. All right, Steve Jones, I'd entertain a motion to, or I would make a motion to adjourn at 10 p.m. We have a hand up. Oh, sorry, we have a hand up. Mayor Lee Beebe, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, I couldn't get to my button on time. Um, just a quick, um, I'm, I wanna go back to uh, an uh, item you had in your agenda and I actually had to leave the meeting for a little while where you had a lot of vacancies for boards and commissions. And I just was on the town website and, and I was looking for um, the notice about uh, vacancies on boards and commissions. And previously there was a statement there that to um, serve on a board or commission that you had to be a registered voter. Um, is that statement still on the town website or was that removed? And I believe it's still there. You have to be a registered voter in order you have to be an elector of the town. Yes, you have to, to be an them. elector of the town. But I know you don't actually have to be a registered voter to serve on a, on a border commission. Um, I don't believe that the charter requires that. So I will. So um, just as background, I was a co chair of the Charter Revision Commission in 2018. And I and I think we purposefully would not have required that we have to that somebody has to be a registered voter to be able to provide service to the town um, in the event that someone chose not to be. But I will I will double check and research that for you and then I can email it into the town council for discussion. Thank you. I would appreciate that. And Mike, you can also double check the charter to see. So that that's I just wanted to I, I noticed it before and and um, I'll I'll get that back to the town council and to and and I can copy Mike too. Thank you, I appreciate that. And sorry, uh, just to interject, I did see another hand raised um, for the public participation. So I just want to recognize them before we move to adjournment. Okay. Yep. Uh, Annalise. Yep. Hi. So I just wanted to say that, you know, this was a very disappointing meeting, you know, overall. Um, it's it's very, I, I heard a lot of kind of denial of, you know, people, yes, they said, you know, racism does exist, but then there was a lot of denial about the actual effects it has on our children and the people of our community. Um, and that to me is really, um, you know, painful to, to hear, um, you know, because uh, I, I had a friend over here, you know, uh, he was a person of color and he was listening in to this entire meeting. And he said, wow, this is so, <laughs> this is really crazy to hear a bunch of white people talk about racism and to discredit, you know, the effect it has on us, meaning, you know, for him, people of color. And we just heard person after person after person discrediting, you know, how it affects them physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, just their whole life, their whole being, day in and day out. And it is not for you people as white people, you know, to, it, you do not have a right to discredit the reality of racism and how it affects people of color. It, I, I, I just, I, I'm just, I'm blown away. I'm blown away by all of you. I, I am just like, my heart is pounding. I am hurting. You know, I think about my child raising him in this town. I worry for him in the future about when it, because many times in this town, he has been accused of things that have not even been true. You know, and I worry, gosh, when he's a teenager, if he gets accused of something and he comes across a cop, and, and he, you know, and he, you know, admits to something that he actually hasn't done, which has happened time and time again. And, you know, what happens when it gets into, you know, law enforcement in this town? What happens if he gets pulled over in this town? We had a conversation at the dinner table the other day about what to do if, a, if, a, if he gets into a fight in school, like which many boys do in high school, you know, what to do as a black male in a white town, what to do? You know, th those conversations aren't happening at your white dinner tables. They're not. They're happening at my dinner table because I have a black son and I have to figure out what the right advice to give him is. You know, he his safety will be at risk. I have to have conversations about when he, if he gets pulled over, how to handle it. All the things that you've already heard, you've heard all of this. So I'm, I'm just so frustrated because I, I mean, just everybody, everybody here has just just totally discredited, you know, what, what it might feel like to, to be black in this town. And, and, you know, you cannot say that these situations that my son has been through 
has not affected his mental health. You know, I, I said before, it's not normal for a 10 year old to want to move out of his town because he doesn't feel welcome, because he feels uncomfortable. He wants to feel at home. He wants to go to a place where there's more people that are of his own race. That it's not normal, you know? So I, I, I mean, I, you all need to step outside of your own shoes for just one second, because that's all you have to do. You don't actually have to live the life of a person of color. You don't actually have to, you know, be, you know, discriminated against. You don't actually have to experience racism because you're white. I'm white. I haven't either, you know? So just take a moment and just step outside. Just imagine, because that's all you have to do. You don't actually have to live it. But my son does, and other people in this town do. Not very many, but other people do. And I get that you guys are the majority, and they're my, they're minor, they are the minority. So you might not care so much, but you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm frustrated, you know, please take a second, think about others besides yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody else? All right, Steve. All right, Steve Jones, I entertain a motion to adjourn at 10 6 p.m. Move, move, I'll second it. Any discussion? Uh, all right, all those in favor? Uh, Brenda? Aye. Uh, Cassandra? Aye. Steve? Aye. John? Aye. Lou? Aye. Kurt? Aye. Aye. Nice, that's unanimous. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Take care.